number 40 will now come to order. Please stand for the playing of the national anthem. Thank you, and thank you to members of City Council for inviting me to be here. If I understand correctly from the agenda, I have a half an hour. <laughs> no, I saw the agenda earlier today, and I'll keep it brief. Uh, as you may be aware that uh, in the Jewish world, as in many uh, religious communities, we have a lectionary cycle where we read through the Torah, the first five books of Moses, on a weekly basis, every day working our way a little bit further through the five books, and we find ourselves this coming Sabbath at the very end of the book of Numbers. And uh, at the very end of the book of Numbers, the children of Israel have been wandering for 40 years and about ready to enter into the land of Israel, uh, and Moses will give his final speeches before they make their way into the land of Israel. One of the main topics in the Torah portion that we read this week has to do with the apportionment of the land, the various areas in which the different tribes will be, and the establishment of cities and Levitical cities. Uh, very, very technical kind of stuff. And not only is there a discussion of the establishment of the cities, but also, believe it or not, the leaders in each of those cities. And Moses warns the leaders of those cities, knowing that they are going to be in positions of power, that they're not to abuse their power, that they're to use their power to carry out God's word, to carry out justice, and to be an example of holiness before the people of their towns and before the people of other towns. Ultimately, the goal was not self-aggrandizement. The goal was not to make themselves more powerful, but the goal was to be the improved welfare of the people. A lot has transpired since those words were spoken by Moses and those words were recorded by our tradition. And we find ourselves now in 2014 in Columbus, Ohio. It's a different kind of promised land than the one mentioned in the Torah, but our portion is here in this very fine city of Columbus. And the leaders of those cities, those chieftains, that's you today. And you have the power that Moses talked about. And it's my prayer that you will always remember Moses' words and the words of various traditions that remind us that ultimately there is a higher authority. And certainly our system of government, that higher authority, is the people. But it's also the Lord our God who gives us the spirit to continue to work on a regular basis to build the kind of world that we all want to see, a world which is blessed with justice, a world which is blessed with peace, a world in which we can appreciate and encourage each other, a world in which we can find our dreams coming true. So it's my prayer for City Council at this meeting and in all your work ahead that God will bless you in all your worthy endeavors, and may God bless the City of Columbus, and may God bless America. Amen.
Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? So move. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. This week's communications received by the City Clerk's Office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the City Bulletin. Are there any other communications to be read into the record? Yes, President Ginther, members of Council. On July 15, 2014, 497 original initiative petitions titled the Columbus Fair Campaigns Code were filed with my office by petitioners whose committee is comprised of Robert J. Fatrakis, Willis E. Brown, Denise A. Benning, Adedush Zuzanne, M. Patzner, and Jonathan C. Beard. Upon receipt of the petitions, I consulted with the Office of the Columbus City Auditor to confirm that a certified copy of the initiative petition was filed with the auditor prior to circulation of the petition. I was informed that a certified copy of the initiative petition was not filed with the city auditor prior to circulation. Based on those facts, I requested a legal opinion in a memorandum to City Attorney Richard C. Pfeiffer, Jr., dated that same day with respect to the appropriate action and duties of the city clerk, specifically requesting legal advice regarding the clerk's duties relative to the processing of the initiative petition and determining the legal sufficiency of the petition and the signatures contained thereon. On July 16, 2014, City Attorney Pfeiffer responded in writing regarding the effect of noncompliance with Revised Code 731.32 on initiative peti petition, stating in relevant part, the petitioner's failure to comply with the requirements of Revised Code 731.32 by not filing a certified copy of the proposed ordinance with the City Auditor prior to circulation is fatal to their petition. Accordingly, it is my opinion that you are so advised that you have no legal duty as city clerk to take any further action to submit the petition to the Franklin County Board of Elections or City Council, and that refusal to take such action would not amount to an abuse of your discretion. On Friday, July 18, 2014, I provided a copy of the City Attorney's opinion and submitted written notification to City Council President Ginther and members of Council that the aforesaid petition is not legally sufficient, and as a result, I will not be submitting the petition to the Franklin County Board of Elections or City Council. These memoranda and all documents related to this petition are on file in the Office of the City Clerk. Thank you, uh, Clerk Blevins. Are there any uh, uh, comments, uh, announcements, or uh, resolutions from members of Council? Council Member Craig? Uh, thank you, President Genther. I certainly wanted to remind our listening and viewing audience that um, I believe these are the last two uh, Cap City Night events. Uh, Friday, July the 25th at 7 o'clock p.m. at the uh, uh, Douglas Recreation Center at 1300 Windsor Avenue and then Saturday July the 26th uh, Beatty Recreation Center at 247 North Ohio uh, and this would be a movie night showing cloudy with a chance of meatballs too. Uh, these are wonderful events for families and children and I certainly encourage uh, all that can will come out. I've participated in several. And it's just a great night for families to get together. I, I want to uh, have uh, Director McKnight to offer, offer uh, comments regarding both of these events. Director McKnight. Chairman Craig, President Gitter, members of council. Uh, this is, we are offering 12 Cap City Night events over the course of the summer. These are actually number seven and eight, so there are four more which will occur uh, later in July and early August. But this is part of the APPS program uh, and is an outreach to really uh, go into some of the communities where we've had some challenges and to really bring the community out. And as you uh, know, you've been out to several of these. They're very successful in terms of bringing folks out. Uh, we have a good time. We have lots of entertainment, lots of activities, and we would encourage folks to come out and enjoy the events. Thanks very much, uh, Director McKnight. Uh, thank you, uh, President Ginther. That is all that I have with, way, with regard to comments. Thank you, uh, Council Member Craig. Council Member Klein, President Pro Tem Miller, Council Member Mills. Yes, I have one resolution tonight. I have resolution 0130X-2014 to honor and recognize Team Ohio 
women's basketball team for its gold medal at the 2014 National Special Olympics. I'm going to ask the Team Ohio women's basketball team to come down and I'm going to call them by their name as so deserving as they are of champions of our great city. So I'm going to ask champion Pam Hoffman, champion Elizabeth Bowe, champion Shabazz Browder, champion Cara Gregory, champion Tyra Nepper, champion Lydia Lloyd, champion Samantha Baser, champion Lisa Ziegler, champion Amy Williams, and champion Candace Williams with their coach, our very own Megan Kilgore, brought home the gold medal for our great city on June 20th. The team went undefeated in the week-long games in Princeton, New Jersey. These young ladies have brought home gold for us, but what's most impressive is they were practicing and playing at their best, bringing home the gold for our great city while working and being students at the same time. They are champions to be proud of, and we are so grateful for their representation of our great city. They are truly a, a, a testament to all of the hard work and where it can get you. Congratulations on this amazing victory. We are all very proud of you. And with that, I, I move for passage. <laughs> Congratulations. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. That's all I have this evening. Thank you, uh, Council Member Mills. Council Member Paley? Yes, Council President Ginther, I do have one announcement. This year is the 10th annual garden tour for Ganther's Place and will take place on Sunday, July 27th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And the theme this year is Snapshot. They will be featuring old and past photos from the area plus Special settings for photo ops. Bring your cameras. Pedicabs will conveniently take visitors from garden to garden, as well as two beautiful resident maintained parks. As an added bonus, they will be providing complimentary shuttle rides to two nationwide healthy neighborhoods, healthy families, remodeled homes. So don't miss your chance to see the premier event of an up and coming neighborhood on the south side. I will be there. See you at Ganther's Place, located at 566 Reinhardt Avenue this Sunday, July 27th. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Paley. Council Member Tyson. Yes, I have one, re one resolution this evening, and I'm going to ask Lori Marsh, who is Executive Director of Leadership Columbus, to come to the podium, and any of the guests that she is with her can please come forward. And it's resolution 0125X-2014, and it is a resolution that says, whereas to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Leadership Columbus, our community's premier leadership development program. Whereas since 1974, Leadership Columbus has served the Central Ohio community by producing well-informed, engaged, and passionate leaders and preparing those leaders to move Columbus forward. Whereas the mission of Leadership Columbus is to develop, connect, and inspire diverse leaders who, who serve as catalysts in building a strong and vibrant community. And whereas Leadership Columbus has over 2,500 alumni who can be found serving as state and local officials, as City of Columbus cabinet members, as board members of nonprofit organizations, and in countless other leadership roles across a program leadership roles across our region. Whereas Leadership Columbus has been ranked among the top five most effective community leadership training programs in the country. 
whereas Leadership Columbus is responsible for the implementation of over 200 community projects that have directly enhanced the city. And whereas the 40th year of Leadership Columbus will feature expanded programming, including board governance training programs to attract Ohio college students to Columbus to enhance our workforce, <clears throat> excuse me, and the program known as Onboarding Columbus, an orientation resource for relocating executives and their significant others to, to seeking to make Columbus their home. And whereas Leadership Columbus is an invaluable forum through which our community leaders can connect network with others who want to make a difference. And whereas Leadership Columbus is dedicated to the continued development of leaders who will inspire and give back to the Columbus community. Now therefore be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this Council does hereby recognize the 40th anniversary of Leadership Columbus and celebrate its unique contributions to the creation of leaders who represent our, our city. I move for passage. Greg Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Lori, the floor Thank is yours. Thank you so much, Council Member Tyson, for introducing this resolution and for Council Members for adopting it. President Andy Ginther, Council Member Craig, Council Member Klein, Council Member Pro Tem Miller, Council Member Mills, and Council Member Paley. Uh, we are so thrilled. 40 is the new 40 for Leadership Columbus. Um, 40 is the new 35 for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> We are just thrilled and honored um, to be honored at City Council tonight. We, our hearts and souls are with Columbus and our community. President Andy Ginther is a graduate of the class of 2000, so um, he represents us very well. And I would like the, our members, our graduates and stakeholders, past board chairs to introduce themselves. Starting here. 1993. Susan Rector, 1989. Uh, Eddie Pauline, 2013. I'm Tom Katzenmeyer. I was board chair for four years. Four years. Exactly. I wouldn't let him go. <laughs> Tarnita Bradley, class of 2006. And Max Moore, our program director, who without him, nothing would be happening with Leadership Columbus. We also have, if you threw a pebble, or in my case a diamond, in city council chambers, <laughs> you will not, hit, not be able to not hit um, a graduate. We have Annie Marsico who is back there. We have Ken Paul. We have um, Greg Davies, Cabinet Director for Public Utilities. We have, let's see, who else? Erica Clark-Jones, I believe, is here. We have uh, Megan Kilgore, who just received um, a resolution. We have Greg, um, Mike Reese, uh, the Mayor's Chief of Staff, and Christy Angel is also a graduate. So we are so proud of all of our graduates who were leaders when they came in our program and who have honed their skills and connected even more to um, the community through Leadership Columbus. You know, most people, there's a joke going around that um, if it weren't for the people, I would love my job. Well, in my case, it's the opposite. If it, the people are what make my job so unbelievably uh, rewarding and enriching. And what they do in the community while they're in the program and when they go on to be community trustees and stewards of our great city is just completely amazing to me. And that is why I've been able to stay at this job for so long. Um, I know that you've got a marathon meeting come on, coming up, so I don't want to take up too much time, but Max um, does have some material that we want to pass out to you, which is our new branding material that we have invested in because as 40 is the new 40, we are launching a new fundraising campaign to build capacity so that we can promote the programs and provide the services to the community that we need, which is onboarding Columbus, which is our deep dive you know, uh, into Columbus. Uh, also, our Envision Columbus for college students so that we can go to college campuses, bring them here for two days so they can learn about why they should choose Columbus as a city to live in once they graduate. Um, and also our board governance and board matching program because we really believe that board matching is an art. If you're not passionate about the topic on the board that you serve, um, you're not going to be good for anybody. So we're really excited about that. I also just wanted to mention real briefly too that one of the parts of our program that kind of undergoes um, not as much of the limelight as our group projects, which we, which we do for the, as a part of the laboratory experience of Leadership Columbus. This past year, um, we had 
uh, 12 group projects, two that I wanted to just highlight real briefly, the Women's Health Fair in partnership with New Directions Career Center, um, which was a need that they identified, um, and also Project Pledge, which stands for Play, Learn, Explore, Discover, Grow, and Experience in partnership with the Milo Grogan uh, Recreation Center. Um, this group of Leadership Columbus participants really beefed up the Recreation Center's offerings for the summer, offering them unbelievable experiences for that rec center. So we are all about now touting what we do so people really can understand and embrace us. And um, uh, our new tagline will be, LC is for the city of our future, for the future of our city. And um, as I always tell classes, you may not remember everything we tell you in the statistics and the, the actual facts of Leadership Columbus, but you'll never forget how we made you feel. And what I really believe is it's the way we make you feel as part of Leadership Columbus and afterwards that keeps that passion ignited and keeps people making a difference, a significant, meaningful difference in our Columbus community. So thank you so much for this wonderful honor. It's been my privilege to serve the community. And hopefully I can keep doing it for until I end up in a landfill somewhere, in <laughs> Grove City, where my husband might put me if I continue working this hard. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Tyson, for uh, offering this resolution. I'm a 1985 graduate. Oh, yes. Of, uh, Council leadership. Member Herschel Craig. I'm sorry, that was before uh, my of, time. Thank of you. The uh, program, and, it, and it's meant uh, uh, a great deal to me, uh, the young person that I am. Yes. Uh, but it certainly has made an indelible imprint on my life and the opportunity to serve, uh, and certainly the relationships developed while uh, in the program. So it's multifaceted. Uh, and uh, I certainly appreciate your work and your leadership. And many of the folks that are standing up here, uh, I know them well, appreciate their service and their leadership. And again, thank you so much uh, for all that you're doing for the city of Columbus, our young people, our, our older young people, and all of us that's, that uh, have opportunities to serve. Thank you, Councilmember Craig. My apologies for not mentioning you among our graduates. They're just, they're just everywhere. It's just really exciting for us. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. And again, thank you for coming down. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Tyson. Any comments from our elected officials, uh, City Auditor? Any requests by members of Council for the removal of an ordinance or resolution from the consent action portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30-day legislation by the City Clerk? So moved. Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Will the clerk now read into the record the ordinance numbers of 30-day legislation on tonight's agenda for first reading? Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 1437, 1530, 1542, 1585, 1603, 1610, 1616, 2014. Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinances 1677 and 1683, 2014. Development Committee Ordinances 1638 and 1686, 2014. Rules and Reference Committee Ordinances 0170-2014, 1785-2014. Zoning Committee Ordinances 1209, 1665, and 1694-2014. Following ordinances appear on our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read the ordinance numbers of each into the record? Resolutions of Expression 126X and 127X-2014, Finance Committee. Ordinances 1669, 1693, 1708, 1727, and 1750-2014. Health and Human Services Committee Ordinances 1569 and 1578-2014. Recreation and Parks Committee 
ordinances 1469, 1503, 1698, 1706, 1722 2014, Public Safety and Judiciary Committee ordinances 1614, 1615, 1670, 1761 2014, Public Utilities Committee ordinances 1207, 1257, 1259, 1273, 1280, 1288, 1315, 1334, 1359, 1392, 1395, 1405, 1408, 1410, 1414, 1422, 1423, 1474, 1497, 1505, 1519, 1553, 1649, 1651, 1666, 1753-2014, Public Service and Transportation Committee, Ordinances 1087, 1494, 1502, 1520, 1576, 1582, 1588, 1591, 1620, 1626, 1627, 1645, 1684, 1688, 1707, and 1709-2014, Technology Committee, Ordinances 1458, 1459, 1489, 1619, 1723-2014. Development Committee, Ordinances 1483, 1500, 1653, 1647, 1650, 1681, 1682, 1692, 1710, 1724, 1732, 1733, 1734, 1738, 1739, 1740. 1741, 1742-1743-2014, Environment Committee, Ordinances 1675, 1690, 1691, 1715-2014, and Appointments from the Mayor's Office numbered A0105, 106, 108, 109, 110, 111, and 115-2014. Thank you, uh, Clerk Blevins. We do have one uh, speaker on the consent agenda this evening, um, Mr. Nathaniel George Wilkins. Mr. Wilkins, if you could make your way to the podium, share your name, address, any organizations you represent. Sir, you've signed up to speak in support of 1743-2014 in the Development Committee. Uh, sir, you have three minutes. 1612 or Arlington Avenue, Mr. Lothane Joyce Wilkins, a solely a term is a solely for vacant and abandoned property in the North London area. Um, I just got a couple of questions. I, I would like to know what this property is going to be used for. 851, 853 East 2nd Avenue, and what it would be used for. And also, just like to see if this particular property holding a land bank or whoever purchased it, I'd just like to see a higher standards to any person that buys any land bank property or, or hold into the land bank. So uh, again, my question is, what will this property be used for? Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wilkins, for coming down before I ask uh, Deputy Director Brandon for any Response. Any questions or comments from Mr. Wilkins from council members? Deputy Director Brandon, uh, any light you can shed on uh, purpose or use for this property? Yes, thank you, President Ginther, uh, Chairman Mills. Uh, the property located at 851, 853 East 2nd Avenue is going to be uh, purchased by the adjacent property owner and used as a side yard expansion. It was part of the MOTA Own program, so this individual has already taken some responsibility for the maintenance of the lot. And through that program, we will be reimbursing him for a portion of the activity, and he is going to expand his yard. So it's going to be back into productive use. Thank you, uh, Deputy Director Brandon. Any other questions or comments regarding the consent agenda? If not, I have a motion for approval of these items designated as consent actions. So moved. Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll by voice. Craig? Yes. Klein? Yes. Miller? Yes. Mills? Yes, with the exception of 1750, 1207, 1257, 1273, 1280, 1423, 1500, on which I am abstaining. Paley? Yes, with the exception of 1691, on which I'm abstaining. Tyson? 
Yes, with the exception of 1569-2014, 1578-2014, and 1483-2014, with, with, on which I am abstaining. President Ginther. Yes, consent agenda carries. We'll now proceed with the second reading of 30-day table and emergency legislation. The first committee is the Finance Committee. Councilmember Tyson chairs that committee. Madam Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you. The first ordinance I have is Ordinance 1456-2014 to authorize the Finance and Management Director to enter into a contract for the, for the option to purchase automotive preventive maintenance services from Ashland, Inc., doing business as Va Va Valvoline Instant Oil Change to authorize expenditure of $1 to establish the contract from the general fund and to declare an emergency. And with that, I first of all I move to take it from the move to take from the table, from voice vote. Craig, yes. Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, yes. Tyson, yes. President Ginther. Thank you. The next ordinance is ordinance number 1699-2014. Oh, I'm sorry. I heard men move for passage. Mm -hmm. By voice. Craig, yes. Klein, yes. Miller, <coughs> Mills, Paley, Tyson. Yes. President Ginther. Yes. Thank you. As I begin to read the next ordinance, I think we have a couple speakers on this ordinance. Um, either Bill Jennison and if Jim Kunk is in the audience to start walking towards the podium. I know that also Mary Duffy. So this Ordinance number 1699-2014 to consent to the issuance of tax and lease revenue anticipation bonds by the Franklin County Convention Facilities Authority and to enter into a supplemental lease agreement and supplemental sublease agreement with the Franklin County Convention, Convention Facilities Authority as required and to declare an emergency. And so with that, I'm going to ask Mr. Bill Jennison to um, give comments on this on this legislation. Yes. Uh, thank you, President Ginther, Council Member Tyson. Uh, this, res this ordinance will allow us provide the consent of City Council to allow us to issue bonds to renovate the Convention Center and to expand the Convention Center. It, about $125 million in project funds, plus the opportunity to refund some of our existing bonds. The Convention Center renovation is about a $68 million project, which will completely redo the interiors. And the goal is to bring up the entire convention center up to a hotel level of quality. Uh, the expansion will expand to the north by adding additional exhibit space, meeting space, and pre-function space. And it will position Columbus well so that we will um, move from fifth in our competitive set up to third when, it, when measured by contiguous exhibit space. Um, with me tonight is our uh, vice chairman, Mr. Jim Kunk, and Mary Duffy, our bond counsel. And we would be glad to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Council President Ginther. Thank you, uh, Chair Tyson. Um, I guess this uh, might not be a, a fair question, but I'll pose it anyway. When we land the Democratic National Convention in 2016, what does, uh, what does this type of investment um, help us do as a city uh, to show off, you know, to con conventions and conferences around the country, what kind of investment uh, and what would this do to the convention center in the way of landing those types of conferences? It, it will help us in two ways. One, we will have, um, you are our partners with the Columbus Hilton downtown, and by opening that property, we really upped the game in Columbus on what people expect in, as it relates to ballroom space and meeting space. This will bring all of the Hyatt meeting rooms and their banquet space up to the same level as the Hilton as well as all of the meeting space within the convention center. Um, also beyond uh, the DNC, it will allow us to compete for multiple events so that we can have one event in part of the exhibit halls and be setting up in another one. Um, as it relates to the DNC, we've, we fully ex expect and hope that we will land that, that, conference, that convention. Um, and we've staged the project so that we will be able to make sure that we are fully able to uh, handle it if we're awarded it. Council Member Mills. Can you share with me, you mentioned uh, moving from fifth to third. Can you share with me who's in the middle and also the ratio of decline that you talked about that 
as a result of not having the space the number of opportunities that we may have had to say no to because okay. of competing capacities and then the, in terms of bodies and capacity what would the change bring about yeah we've actually uh, well we would move us to third which would be behind indianapolis and kansas city uh, we would have 375,000 square feet of contiguous space um, We've experienced Columbus and SMG, the convention center staff, have looked at all of our existing customers as well as customers who would now fit within the expanded convention center. Um, they've identified over $2.2 million in annual rent that could, be, um, could become part of our, our business with this expanded space. Councilman I can provide McCline. the list to your staff C if you'd like. Councilman McCline. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Jennison, can you touch upon how this affects the taxpayers of the city of Columbus? You know, you're asking the, the city to grant the permission for uh, issuing the bonds, and how does that relate to um, any sort of uh, relationship with the taxpayers? Yeah. These bonds would be fully paid for by the existing hotel motel tax that the convention authority levies. Uh, there would be no city funds involved. Uh, we've been fortunate for 24 years. Both the city and the county have lent their support to the convention center borrowings. And over that 24-year period, neither the city or the county has ever had to pay a penny's worth of debt service. Uh, there's ample reserve funds. Um, Auditor Dorian was instrumental in the original structure of the bond issue. And I think he can attest that the reserves will remain full and hopefully never used. Thank you. So this legislation will pay for $125 million in renovations and expansions, and the FCCFA is requesting authority to refinance three existing bonds totaling $154.4 million. And so with that, uh, and we're really excited. We're really excited about this project. Certainly, we think that the Convention Center looks great now, but we're excited to see the changes that are going to happen, happen at, at um, the new and improved facility. So with Thanks. that, I would move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Great. Thank you. Thank you Thanks for coming much. down this evening. This evening, I'll be also introducing five ordinances authorizing the city to issue and provide fund, refunds on up to $133.3 million in outstanding general obligation bonds and also issue up to $18.1 million in notes to refund outstanding bond anticipation notes. In the past, by taking advantage of changes in the market, the city has been able to save taxpayers millions of dollars through similar refinancing. Although the exact amount of savings will not be gener will, that will be generated by this refunding is yet to be determined, these ordinances will allow the auditor to execute a transaction that will, re will result in savings for our taxpayers. And before I begin to read the ordinances, Mr. Auditor Dorian, would you like to make a few comments? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and all council members. These five ordinances, again, let me say, are refunding, so they do not bring new additional debt to the city. Uh, I ask your support of the ordinances, and I do believe that in this refunding, we probably should achieve a savings of at least $2 million. Thank you. Thank you, Auditor Dorian. The first ordinance is 1700-2014, is to authorize the issuance of unlimited tax bonds in the amount not to exceed $81,665,000 for the purpose of providing funds to refund certain outstanding general obligation bonds of, of the city, Section 55B of the City Charter. First, I move to waive second reading. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Now I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. The next ordinance is 1701-2014 to authorize the issuance of limited tax bonds in an amount not to exceed $40,700,000 for the purpose of providing funds to refund certain outstanding general obligation bonds of the city, of the, of the city Section 55B of the City Charter. First, I move to waive second reading. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you, and now I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. 
Thank you. The next ordinance is 1702-2014 to authorize the issuance of unlimited tax bonds, federally taxable, in an amount not to exceed $9,795,000 for the purpose of pro providing funds to refund certain outstanding general obligation bonds of the city, Section 55B of the City Charter. First, I move to waive second reading. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you, and now I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. The next ordinance is 1703-2014. It's to authorize the issuance of limited tax bonds, federally taxable, in an amount not to exceed $1,175,000 for the purpose of providing funds to refund certain outstanding general obligation bonds of the city, Section 55B of the City Charter. First, I move to waive second reading. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you, and I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. The, <clears throat> the last ordinance in this series is 1712-2014 to authorize the issuance of limited tax, limited tax notes in the, in the amount of not to exceed $18,100,000 $100,000 to refund outstanding bond anticipation notes issued for the purpose of financing the cost of, a tran of transportation projects, Section 55B of the City Charter. And this would be for the, uh, um, really this particular ordinance is in relationship to the parking garages. So with that, first I move to waive second reading. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. <coughs> Excuse me. The next ordinance is 1736-2014 to amend the 2014 Impro Capital Improvement Fund to authorize the city auditor to transfer funds between projects within the Construction Management Capital Improvement Fund to authorize the Finance and Management Director to enter into a contract on behalf of the Office of Construction Management with J.B. and Company, Inc. for the replacement of the North Market Roof to authorize expenditure of $1,080,000 $80,841 from the Construction Management Capital Improvement Fund and to declare an emergency. The current roof at the North Market is beyond its useful per life and has been repaired a number of times. And so we will now want to replace this with a new 30-year warranty. So the North Market is Central Ohio's last remaining public market. It's been operating since 1876 and is heavily visited by residents, tourists, and convention conventioners. And um, annually, more than one million people visit the North Market. So with that, I am going to ask to, for your approval to pass this legislation. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Bailey Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. The next ordinance is uh, ordinance number 1758-2014. And I'm going to ask, um, there's going to be, there are three speakers on this legislation so they can start work, walking towards the front of the room. And this, this ordinance is to authorize the finance and management director to enter into a contract on behalf of the Office of Construction Management with Thomas and Marker Construction Company for the Reeve Avenue Building Renovations Project to authorize and direct the city auditor to transfer $5,720,000 $20,000 from the Special Income Tax Fund to the General Permanent Improvement Fund and the General Government Grants Fund to authorize the City Auditor to uh, appropriate and expend $3,220,000 within the General Permanent Improvement Fund to authorize the City Auditor to appropriate and expend $2,500,000 within the General Government Grants Fund and to authorize the expenditure of $4,253,836 from the Construction Management Taxable Bonds Fund and to authorize expenditure of $1,624,914 from the Construction Management Capital 
Improvement Fund and to declare an emergency. So it's a total of $11,598,750. And so this project involves the renovation and child care addition to the former Reeb Avenue Elementary School, which is a historic landmark in the city's south side. And this facility will be known as Reeb Avenue Center. And now I'm going to allow our speakers to, to share information regarding this particular ordinance. So the first speaker will be Reverend Edgar, who was speaking first. Reverend Edgar, the podium is yours. Thank you. President Ginther and members of City Council, uh, I'm here tonight to just thank you and Mayor Coleman for all you've done in recent years to drive forward the renaissance that is underway in the Southern Gateway area. The funding that you are considering tonight for the Reeves Center will be the pinnacle of all these efforts. Those of us on the South Side remember the leadership that was exercised by City Council in the spring of 2011 when the South Side Settlement House announced that it had run out of money and was about to permanently cease operations. You approved the emergency funds to keep the doors open throughout that summer while plans were made for a transition to a new and better pathway. As part of that plan, the group I run, Community Development for All People, agreed to carry forward the legacy of the Settlement House and a number of its remaining programs. I'm pleased to report that three years later, all of those programs are thriving and participation has more than doubled. Then on Labor Day week in 2011, Mayor Coleman with members of City Council stood on the steps of the Southside Settlement House as the doors were locked forever. That was an incredibly sad day on the South Side. Yet that was also the day that Mayor Coleman pledged that he and City Council would find ways to build forward. He called for champions to join him in bringing new life to Columbus's Southern Gateway. And praise be to God, champions have stepped forward in all sorts of ways, including Jane Grody Abel, who is here this evening. And together, the City Development Department, you and City Council, and all sorts of neighborhood folks and organizations have set in motion a remarkable transformation. The new John Maloney Health Center, millions of dollars in infrastructure. And by the end of this year, in ventures that my organization and others have been doing, there are more than 200 homes in this target area of 50 square blocks that will have been repaired, renovated, or built new from the ground up, representing 20% of that entire community's housing stock. Tonight, you're poised to approve funding for the central crown jewel in this renaissance, the renovation of the Reeves School into a state-of-the-art community center. And once again, it's the passion and the investment of all of the community, but especially these Southside champions that I want to lift up. Tanny Crane, Jane Grody Abel, and their families, along with the Kellys and the Williams, have been amazing in giving forward. And with your support and your cooperation, we are now at what is truly a historic moment. Tonight, you ensure for future generations the ongoing renaissance of Columbus's Southern Gateway as you approve money for this center. Thank you very much from the folks on the South Side. Thank you, Reverend Edgar. I don't know, I know I have speaker slips and I don't know if Jane, if you, and then everyone else has slips too, so. I just would like to step forward to say thank you, um, one for the mayor for being a champion, but for your leadership in this initiative. I truly believe that this partnership really represents the us in Columbus. It is a public-private partnership, and um, it is a labor of love. Uh, we have done over 60 tours of this building. It's an incredible building. We really look forward to the day that we can groundbreak. Um, I also would like to thank the Finance and Development Department, Paul, and also Erica, who serve on our board and our public-private partnership, and the, their leadership has been outstanding as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jane, for coming down. And let's see, Curtis Davis. I'm Curtis Davis. I'm the vice chair of the Southside Area Commission. And the biggest thing I can say is wow and thank you. Um, we've had a lot of things happening on the South Side. I think the approval tonight for the Reeb Center is going to be one of those other catalysts that we're going to have that will uh, help the South Side take off. We've got some new restaurants that are going to be announced in a couple weeks that you guys can all come visit and some other things that are happening on the South Side. So uh, pay attention. Uh, like Director Shoney said a couple of weeks ago in the dispatch, uh, we will be the next short north. So uh, mark, mark my word on that one. So thank you. Linda Henry. 
I'm Linda Henry, and I'm co-chair of Reeve Hozak Stilton Village Committee, and I want to say thank you for approving this. This is a great milestone for our south side and the Reeve Hozak area. It means so much that we are finally going to come together and have ample space for uh, the learning committee. And, or, Sounds like thank you. <laughs> and the Boys and Girls Club and different organizations in that in that building. It means so much to keep that building renovated or renovated and keep it going. And that's I just want to say thank you very much for doing this. Mr. Lichty. Hello, I'm Bob Lichty, Executive Director of Parsons Avenue Merchant Association and uh, President Emeritus of the Board of Southside Learning Development Center. And my hair was dark and long when we started this process, but this is exciting. Uh, as Vice President Biden might say, this is a really big deal. So this is all about partnerships. It truly is, as you are hearing and seeing here tonight. And this is about renewal, to rebuild neighborhoods, to rebuild commercial corridors. You have to help the families rebuild themselves, rebuild themselves financially. And the main tool to do this is education. The center represents a phenomenal facility and phenomenal programs in education from zero up from the early learning programs to the Boys and Girls Club to the wonderful programs Community Development for All People is having in there to the um, ne Southside Neighborhood Pride Center uh, to the New Learning Center. Every, it's just a phenomenal amount of stuff. And what's cool is seeing how this center is going to partner with the other incre increasing partnerships in the area to, to really see the John Maloney Center kicking in now and having new programs like the, the Moms to Be program that just got started here this month. You know, this, this is a big deal. And to have these folks in this kind of proximity, I do tours, a lot of tours of the, the avenue and the areas around there. And we always end up down at the, sort of what I call the ground zero of the Southern Gateway area. And this project is a catalyst for a lot of new things coming. And when you look at other things that are in the queue, that, you know, a 20,000 square foot library branch being planned about a mile north of there, um, just the range of things. Uh, it's just wonderful. And in particular, I'd just like to thank folks at the city, folks in the development department for their vision to do the, uh, the land swap you know, with Columbus City Schools. That's how we were able to preserve this wonderful icon, uh, Reeve Elementary. And uh, Erica Clark Jones and Community Relations Commission. I mean, she herds the cats for the Southern Gateway work, and uh, we would be nowhere without their efforts and leadership. So thank you. Many of you have been very supportive here for a long time coming, and uh, this is a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for coming down. And you're, you're all champions, and so thank you for your work. Councilmember Paley. All of you are, I, I see on a daily basis on the south side. And when I walk down um, anywhere in the city, I, my heart swells because I feel like I made a difference um, in everything that I do. So when you walk by, Reeb, in the future, you need to say, I did that. I made that happen for my community because you did. And thank you for everything that you've done. Councilman Craig. Thank you very much, Chair Tyson. I, I tell you, it's difficult to find another initiative more important than this in our nation. Um, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, John, John Ivenick always gets me when I say it's not hyperbole, and that's not hyperbole. Um, we started out, uh, you know, Reverend Edgar, you know, from the very beginning. And Jane and all of those that have come to the table, uh, uh, Linda, I could name names, write everyone that is standing here. I uh, remember almost 30 years ago serving on Southside Learning and Development's board. And what that will mean for the children and families um, in, in, uh, in, in not only in that, in that neighborhood, but in our city, and the implications for this uh, for generations uh, is so vital. I'm still loving that Donato's pizza. <laughs> and, uh, and I love it. I want to say something about that. But I tell you, for what you all are doing and the template that you represent where private sector and public sector comes together on behalf of families and children is just such a powerful example of service and how we treat our neighbors and our children so that everybody has an opportunity 
to have quality of life. So God bless you. Thank you all for what you're doing for all of us. Thank you, Councilman Craig. And, and before we pass legislation, I just want to, again, thank, I know, Erica Clark-Jones, because um, from the very beginning, you have certainly been a champion in moving this forward. I also want to thank Director Paul Rakowski um, for all the, also the viewing listing audience. The city currently owns this building and will continue to own the building. And so, um, and they're working with and making sure we're having leases with all the tenants and working with the public the, the public private partnership. I also want to acknowledge that the state of Ohio did put money into this project and I know that that um, I know that Jane and Tanny and a lot of people worked hard on making that happen. So it truly is a public private partnership and just very excited about this. So I know and Councilman Craig you worked on this early on when it was at your committee and so thank you for your work. And so with that um, we are so excited about this and uh, I want to move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Kinther. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. The next ordinance, if I could move to Health and Human Services. Thank you. The first ordinance is 1642-2014. It's to authorize and direct the Board of Health to enter into a contract with the Columbus Neighborhood Health Center for the provision of a medical director services and to authorize expenditure of $37,849 from the Health Department's Grants Fund and Health Special Revenue Fund to weigh the provisions of competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code and to declare an emergency. This contract will provide for physician services at the women Health Family and Planning Clinic at the Columbus Public Health, and um, this this individual will be we're waiving competitive bidding because the, the medical director services come from the Columbus Neighborhood Health Centers, and so with that I will um, move for passage. And first of all, I move wanted to take from the table by voice vote. Craig, Klein, Miller, Mills. Paley? Yes. Tyson? Yes. President Ginther? Yes. Thank you. I'll move, move for passage by voice vote. Craig? Klein? Yes. Miller? Mills? Paley? Yes. Tyson? Yes. President Ginther? Thank you. The next ordinance is 1724-2014 to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into a contract with the Community Shelter Board to assist with the acquisition costs of the site which is being renovated and converted into the front door shelter serving homeless individuals and to authorize expenditure of $350,000 from the Housing Preservation Fund and to declare an emergency. This particular facility will house two, have a 250-bed homeless shelter for single adult men and women and also overflow space for 20 to 40 families experience homelessness. I move for passage. Clerk call the roll on 1725-2014. Craig, Klein, Miller, Mills, Bailey, Tyson, President Ginther. Legislation passes. Thank you. The next ordinance is ordinance number 1744-2014 to authorize the appropriation of $75,000 from the unappropriated balance of the Emergency Human Services Fund to Columbus Public Health to approve the grant application from the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Franklin County seeking, seeking emerg emergency assistance costs associated with the community, community conversations on mental health action plan pursuant to Columbus City Codes and to authorize the Board of Health to execute a grant agreement with NAMI Franklin County to provide support for the community conversations on mental health action plan and to authorize expenditure of $75,000 from the Emergency Human Services Fund and to declare an emergency. I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. If I could now move to workforce development. Thank you. And I'm going to ask um, President Harrison to walk towards the podium. It's ordinance 1440-2014. It's to authorize the director of the Department of Education to enter into a contract with Columbus State Community College to provide career readiness training for our city's unemployed and underemployed citizens to authorize expenditure of five 
$500,000 from the Neighborhood Cert Initiatives Fund and to authorize expenditure of $1 million from the General Fund. The city has asked Columbus State to lead an initiative called Fast Path, which is a program designed to identify and connect at risk underemployed and unemployed adults to technical skills and employability training that will prepare them for the workplace. And this legislation is being co-sponsored by President Ginther, Councilmember Mills. This was $500,000 of the $1.5 million is an amendment by Councilmember Mills. And so with that, Dr. Harrison, the podium is yours. Thank you, uh, President Ginther, uh, members of council. Um, especially grateful to Councilmember Tyson uh, for uh, sponsoring this legislation as part of the Workforce Development Committee. We are uh, uh, incredibly fortunate uh, in this city uh, to have our elected officials who really are focused on uh, these issues, both large and small, to be able to do the big things, but really to understand um, the, the details that it takes to help all of our citizens access the prosperity uh, in the city. And that's really a big part of what, uh, what Fast Path is about. Just by way of context, uh, again, I want to acknowledge uh, President Ginther and Mayor Coleman for their uh, leadership on the Columbus Education Commission, of which I was a part. And, and that's where some of these conversations really started. And one of the uh, recommendations from the commission uh, was a focus on students with a purpose and really helping our young people uh, as quickly as possible understand what careers uh, are possible and giving them the skills uh, to access those careers. Uh, then in a later conversation with uh, uh, Council Member Tyson, uh, we talked about how to help adults uh, transition into those same opportunities and uh, your support of a program that we've called Cougar Bridge uh, is, uh, is uh, greatly appreciated and the ability to help students who really are pretty far from being able to uh, succeed in college to provide a bridge to help them uh, move along. Uh, and then in a, uh, in a conversation with the mayor uh, several months ago, uh, he had asked me to, to uh, talk about income inequality. Uh, and one of the, the glaring issues of even as unemployment uh, continues to improve, uh, employers still aren't finding uh, the, uh, the employees that they need. And the skills gap really is translating into an income gap. And the issue of income inequality is important, uh, especially in, in a city like Columbus, which is seeing a lot of positive economic indicators, yet in per capita income, which is an important measure uh, of how people are feeling and doing in their families, uh, continues to lag, not just nationally, but even within the state. Uh, so we started talking about why that was and what we might be able to do about it. Uh, the mayor uh, commented, uh, really as a question, the colleges in Central Ohio work well together, don't they, Dave? Um, uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, we do. Um, um, and that is a great help of students who are in the system, but there are still thousands of adults who have a hard time accessing the system. Uh, and that's really where Fast Path um, was, uh, was initiated. Um, so we've put together a, uh, a program uh, that reaches out to un- and underemployed adults, helps them get uh, into a, uh, a training program quickly and into a designated job quickly. Uh, so we've got a, a growing network of employers um, who, again, have specific jobs that they've identified. Um, it's enabling us to uh, work with community agencies um, and others to help bring um, uh, students into that system and help those who are, uh, may need a little bit of a nudge, may uh, be in a fragile situation where if we can get them a little bit of training uh, and, um, and some support once they get in the job, uh, it should give uh, them an opportunity uh, to thrive uh, for many years. We're really focused uh, not just on the initial entry level job, uh, but I'm really helping launch their career um, and uh, put them on a path not just to, um, to, to, to thrive initially, but to help them uh, prepare both from a career standpoint and ideally uh, from a, a, an educational standpoint as well. One of the um, elements of the infrastructure uh, that we already have in place is a regional partnership called the Central Ohio Compact. Uh, and that's where the uh, higher ed institutions in K-12 have come together uh, with the regional goal of having 60% of our adults hold a post-secondary credential 
by 2025. Um, that post-secondary credential is vital uh, to really help our region uh, thrive uh, in a global economy. Uh, FastPath will open that pathway uh, for a lot of adults who are struggling to find their way in that space now, but are still pretty close. Uh, and the ability to really give them uh, that momentum uh, 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 catalyst is something that we're really focused on here. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. And certainly um, <clears throat> know that this group of people has some of the, even though we have low unemployment in the city of Columbus, the group of individuals you're talking about, we have some of the highest unemployment in those areas. So we know how important a program like this is for the residents of our community. And certainly um, this council wants to work closely with you and, and um, Director Johnson and certainly looking at all the metrics of the program because you want to make sure the key is that individuals get the skill sets they need to be able to go out in those jobs, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, those jobs can lead really to their a career for them because we certainly don't want all minimum minimal minimum paying jobs. We need to be able to continue to 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 escalate and be able to pro provide for their families in such a significant way. So uh, we will certainly be working closely with you on the program and uh, to ensure that we have the you know great results for our city um, so with that I would um, again um, thank President Ginther um, Councilmember Mills and um, for helping to to fund this to this initiative and uh, we'll be working closely with you on it, Look forward so, to it. thank you thank you very much uh, Councilman Craig uh, yes uh, Chair Tyson I just had a question uh, for uh, Dr. Harrison, uh, what is your mechanism for outreach? How does one learn about this to, and to be able to uh, participate in the, the initiative? Our, uh, our starting point so far has been to work through existing agencies, um, COIC um, and others um, who uh, already are working uh, with many of these folks that, that, that we're involved in. Uh, the demonstration site, the employer that we're focused on or have been so far has been Nationwide Children's. Uh, so we're really uh, looking uh, to uh, start things in that space. Um, and, uh, and again, through COIC and uh, Franklin County uh, Job and Family Services, we've got an initial plan in place to start to get the word out and really help folks understand um, how inclusive this is. Uh, and we feel like we've got uh, an infrastructure in place now that we can uh, cast the net widely uh, and help uh, individuals find the right path regardless of their individual circumstances. Thank you. Bing, any other questions or comments? If not, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Thank each of you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Harrison. The last ordinance I have is 1652-2014 to authorize the director of development to enter into a contract with the Central Ohio Workforce Investment Corporation for the administration of workforce development programs and, and services and to authorize expenditure of $50,000 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. And I think there's a speaker here. Is Frankie Nolan? Good, Good evening. evening to all the council members and President Ginther. I'm here just to say thank you. Thank you to the City of Columbus and the council for supporting us over the last 10 years. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary of job training and uh, job placement about two weeks ago. And from our inception, the city was right there with us. And we um, are really thankful that we have the city support so that we can continue our services to our residents who are looking for jobs. Thank you for coming down and COBIC is our one stop shop for employment services in the, within our city. And so uh, Ms. Nolan, if someone wants to get in contact with uh, COWIC, could you please give out your the phone number and how they can get in contact with COWIC, please? Yes, they can come to COWIC at 1111 East Broad Street our telephone number is 614-559-4798.
And also we have two access points, one at Jewish Family Services, one at uh, Goodwill Columbus, and we also just opened up a job center that's housed at the West Side Neighborhood Health Clinic. Uh, it opened up in uh, April. What we're trying to do is get in all quadrants of the city so that we can take our services to the job seekers who are not always able to get down to 1111 <coughs> East Broad Street. Thank you, and with that, I will move for passage by voice vote. Craig, Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Tyson. Our next committee is the Recreation and Parks Committee. Councilmember Craig chairs that committee. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, President Ginter. Tonight in the Recreation and Parks Committee, I have Ordinance uh, uh, 1482-2014 uh, to authorize and direct the Director of Recreation and Parks to modify uh, the contract with Double Z Construction, Inc. for the Dorenzo, Dorenzo Park Covert uh, improvements to authorize the expenditure of $2,322 from the Recreation and Parks Voted Bonds Fund to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Budget to authorize the uh, City Auditor to transfer $2,322 within the Voted Recreation and Parks Bond Fund and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. 1719-2014 to authorize and rec the the, rec the Director of Recreation and Parks to enter into contract with Gunek Construction uh, Company for the Lincoln Park uh, Pool Improvements project, project to authorize the expenditure of $4,168,000 with a contingency of $200,000 for a total of $4,368,000 from the Recreation and Parks Voted Bonds Fund to authorize the city auditor to transfer $168,000 within the voted recreation and bonds fund to amend the 2014 capital improvements budget and to declare an emergency. This ordinance will provide for the removal and replacement of the existing, the existing uh, Lincoln Bath House structure located at Lincoln Park. The work will also include a complete pool replacement which will bring this facility up to code with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, Director McKnight comments. Chairman Craig, President Gitter, members of council, this is a continuation of the pool renovations that uh, we've undertaken. Uh, we uh, redid Dodge several years ago. Uh, Maryland is nearing completion and uh, at the end of this swim season, we'll begin work on this one uh, and hopefully have this pool opened up for the 2015 swim season. It'll have all the elements that you've seen for example, at Dodge Pool with the slides and the play elements. So we're real excited about this project and look forward to uh, your support. Uh, thank you, Director McKnight. Uh, if there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Uh, thank you, President Ginther. That is all that I have in recreation and parks. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Craig, our next committee is the Public Safety and Judiciary Committee. Councilmember Klein chairs that committee. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Ginther. The first piece in public safety tonight is 1072-2014 to authorize the city attorney to enter into the third year of a three-year contract with LexisNexis Division of Reed Elsevier, Inc. for the provision of online legal research services to authorize the expenditure of $54,216 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next is 1433-2014 to authorize and direct 
The Director of Public Safety on behalf of the Division of Support Services to enter into a contract with Motorola Corporation for the first phase of upgrading with the city's 800 megahertz radio system from an analog to a P25 digital system in accordance with the sole source provisions of the Columbus City Code to authorize the expenditure of $11,494,403 from the Public Safety Capital Improvement Fund and to declare an emergency. Uh, Deputy Director, could you please enlighten us on the sole source provision of this piece of legislation? Chairman Klein, President Ginther, members of council, this is the first significant upgrade, or should I say the, a major upgrade to our radio communication system for police and fire in over uh, 20 years. This will basically take us into the digital age. Uh, both the uh, federal government uh, and the manufacturing industry is moving to digital. Uh, we are having an increasingly difficult time getting parts for what is currently an analog 800 megahertz system. So we need to begin this migration. This particular ordinance will uh, essentially fund half at the beginning of that migration. Uh, we will our hope to uh, get the additional funding out of next year's 2015 capital budget to complete this process, which will uh, greatly enhance the capabilities of our safety forces and other non-safety divisions to depend on this radio system, including um, refuse collectors, uh, code enforcement, um, water, sewers and drains, et cetera. So uh, we thank you for consideration of this ordinance this evening. Okay. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Sure. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Dyson, President Ginther. 1667-2014, to authorize the Finance and Management Director on behalf of the Fleet Management Division to enter into various contracts for upfitting and purchase of anti-idling devices for the Division of Police Vehicles. Uh, to authorize the appropriation and expenditure of $1.3 million from the Special Income Tax Fund and to declare an emergency. Deputy Director. Yes. Uh, Chairman Klein, President Ginther, members of the Council, uh, we owe a, a great amount of effort in this to our Fleet Management Division and Finance and Management for uh, essentially enabling us not only to upfit these vehicles, to provide these new vehicles which Council previously approved with the anti-idling component which will essentially be an automated system that uh, it is hoped will save us uh, thousands of gallons of fuel for uh, police vehicles uh, when they are idling uh, on duty. So again, um, well obviously once this, this upfit is done, uh, we will obviously uh, look to fleet management to provide us some data on how well we're doing and, and look to uh, make this a win-win a for both of us. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Director. I certainly uh, am appreciative of the work the Finance Department did, uh, Director Rakowski. Uh, you know, this is a win not only for the environment, but I think you noted, Deputy Director, about the uh, cost savings to the taxpayer by putting in these anti-idling devices um, to save um, the taxpayer money to uh, save the environment. Uh, any questions or comments? I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 1689 2014 to authorize the finance and management director to enter into a contract with dj bradley company inc to provide capital infrastructure replacement of office furnishings at the central safety building to waive competitive bidding provisions of the columbus city codes to authorize the expenditure of hundred thousand dollars from the public safety geo bonds fund and to declare an emergency uh, deputy director the waiving competitive bidding sir yes. Chairman Klein, President Gither, members of council, uh, the reason for this is when we had the water leak back in January, uh, there was a significant amount of uh, office furniture that was replaced. Uh, we have a need to buy some additional furniture regardless, and we want to obviously make that furniture match the existing uh, equipment that was purchased. This is the vendor that supplied that particular equipment, so that is the reason for waivers so that we get uh, the equipment, uh, the same furniture that matches what has just gone in here in the last quarter or so. Thank you, Deputy Director. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 1745 2014 to amend the 2014 capital improvement budget to authorize the city auditor to transfer funds between projects. Within the safety voted bond fund, to authorize the finance and management director to enter into a contract on behalf of the Office of Construction Management with Palmetto Construction Services, LLC, for partial renovation of 1120 Morse Road, to authorize the expenditure of $947,677 from the safety voted bond fund, and to declare an emergency. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 
Uh, President Ginther, I have two pieces in rules and reference. I know we're getting near zoning. Would you like me to proceed to rules and reference? Actually, uh, Mr. Chairman, if we could uh, entertain a recess of regular meeting number 40, we'll reconvene at 6.30 for zoning and take on rules and reference in your other committee uh, considerations, if that's okay. Entertain a motion for recess. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Regular meeting number 40 uh, in recess. We'll reconvene at 6.30 for zoning. Regular meeting number 41 will now come to order. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Bailey, Tyson, President Ginther. Any communications and reports received by the city clerk? No, there are none. Any first readings of 30-day legislation? No, there are none. We will now go to the zoning committee. President Pro Tem Miller chairs the committee. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Ginther. Before beginning the zoning agenda, I'll briefly explain the rules of council as pertaining to speaking before council on zonings and variances. We permit three speakers on each side, three proponents and three opponents, and we ask that they limit their remarks to three minutes on each side, and we provide an opportunity for rebuttal from the applicant. Um, also, um, on the advice of the city attorney's office, we ask that anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against uh, council variants, including staff, please stand and raise your right hand and be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. You may be seated. First in zoning tonight, we have uh, 1546, 2014, to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3333.02 AR12 ARLD and AR1, Apartment Residential District Use, 3312.21, Landscaping and Screening, 3312.49, Minimum Number of Parking Spaces Required, 3333.09, Area Requirements, 3333.12, Fronting, 3333.18, Building Lines, 3333.25, Side or Rear Yard Obstruction, and 3333.255, perimeter yard of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 1506 Chesapeake Avenue to permit two four-unit dwellings, three-unit um, dwellings, six two-unit dwellings, and two one-unit dwellings on one lot, and one four-unit dwellings on one lot, and reduce development standards in the ER1 apartment residential district to repeal ordinance numbers 2069-2013, 2064-2013 passed on September 23rd, 2013. The applicant is Metropolitan Holdings LLC. Proposed use is one, two, three, and four unit dwelling development with reduced standards. Fifth, uh, it received a fifth by Northwest Area Commission recommendation for approval, and this received the City Department recommendation for approval. And I have no speaker slips. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 1592-2014 to rezone 1415 Chambers Road being point three one plus or minus acres located on the south side of Chambers Road, 335 plus or minus feet west of Northwest Boulevard from R Real District to AR1 Apartment Residential District. The applicant is Guy Williams, Jr. The proposed use is a multi-unit residential development. This received a development commission recommendations for approval, the fifth by Northwest Area Commission recommendation for approval, and also the city department recommendation for approval. And I have no speaker slips. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 1593-2014 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3333.02 AR12, ARLD and AR1, Apartment Residential District, 3312.21, Landscaping and Screening, 3312.25, 
maneuvering three three one two point two nine parking space three 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 point zero five five exception for single or two family dwelling three 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 point zero nine area requirements three 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 point one two fronting on public street three 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 point one eight building lines three 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 point two three d minimum side yard permitted three 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 point two four rear yard three 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 point two five side or rear yard obstruction and three 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 point two five five perimeter yard of the Clement City Code for the property located at 1397 Chambers Road to permit the construction of one two three and four unit dwellings with reduced development standards in the AR1 apartment residential district and to repeal ordinance number 1833 2013 passed on July 22nd 2013 The applicant is Guy Williams, Jr. Proposed use is a mixed residential development with reduced standards. This received a fifth by Northwest Area Commission recommendation for approval and the City Department recommendation for approval. And I have no speaker slips. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 1612, 2014 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3356.03 C4 permitted uses, 3312.29 parking space, 3312.49 minimum number of parking spaces required, and 3371.01 P1 private parking uh, district of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 1379 North High Street and 32 King Avenue to conform a 34 unit apartment building an adjacent parking lot with reduced uh, development standards in the C4 commercial and P1 private parking districts. The applicant is Homeport. Um, the proposed use is to conform an existing 34 unit residential development in an adjacent off street parking lot with reduced development standards. This received the University Area Commission recommendation for approval and also the City Department recommendation for approval. If there are no questions or comments, I would like to first to request to amend to emergency. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next, I'd like to move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next is 1624, 2013 to rezone 40 West 3rd Avenue being 0.34 plus or minus acres located on the north side of West 3rd Avenue, 270 plus or minus feet west of North High Street from I Industrial District to ARO Apartment Office District. The applicant is SND Partners LLC, the proposed use is a multi-unit residential office development. This received a development commission recommendation for approval, the Victorian Village Commission um, recommendation for approval, and also the city department recommendation for approval. And I have no speaker slips. First, I would like to, if there's no questions or comments, I'd like to first request to amend to emergency. Go ahead. No, that's, that's on the next ordinance. Um, first, I would like to, first to request to amend to emergency. Um, you need to rules, read the rules that's right there on the wall. Um, we are right now. I will. Um, request to amend to emergency. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Amended. Next, I'd like to move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. 
Next is 1657, 2014, to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 330414 a Height District 3312.09, aisle 3312.13, driveway 3312.25, Maneuvering 3312.29, parking space 3312.49, minimum number of parking spaces required 3333.23D, minimum side yard permitted 3333.24, rear yard and 3333.25A, height district of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 40 West 3rd Avenue to permit reduced development standards in the ARO apartment office district to a 16 unit apartment and office building. The applicant is SND Partners LLC. The proposed use is a 16 unit apartment and office building. This received a Victorian Village um, Area Commission recommendation for approval and also the uh, City Department recommendation for approval. And first, I would like to go ahead and have a presentation by the staff. Good evening. The applicant has received a recommendation of approval from staff and the Development Commission for a concurrent rezoning to the ARO Apartment Office District. The applicant proposes to develop the property by removing the one-story addition to the original structure and converting it to an office building. The applicant also proposes to build a new 16-unit apartment building as depicted on the site plan. In order to develop the site consistent with the established development pattern, variances for height districts, aisle, driveway, maneuvering, parking space, minimum number of parking spaces required, minimum side yard permitted, rear yard, and height district are requested. Staff finds this request to be compatible and consistent with the zoning and development patterns of the area, and therefore our recommendation is for approval. Uh, thank you. Next, um, we have the opportunity for the applicant. President Ginther, uh, Zoning Chair Miller, and all council members, my name is Dave Perry. I'm a consultant on this project. Um, as staff indicated, the um, property is a, um, a, a large lot, 93 feet wide. It's developed with a um, historic structure that had a, um, a very large, inappropriate addition built to it in the 1960s. SND Partners is proposing to remove that 1960s addition, restore the historic structure, and build a 16-unit apartment building on the property. Um, the, uh, the land use is consistent with the surrounding area. The density is consistent with the surrounding area. Um, there are certain variances to code standards that are, are typical of the application of suburban development standards to historic districts. And um, uh, we would uh, request your approval. I'm, I'm not sure what the... Um, what the speaker uh, is interested in, but I'd be glad to answer uh, your questions following that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do not have any questions for you. I'm interested in what the speaker um, have this evening. And we do have one speaker signed up um, against, and his name is Richard Becker. Could you please um, welcome the council? Uh, please state your name and address any organization that you represent, and you have three minutes. Hi, Richard Becker, 51 West 4th Avenue. I uh, became aware of this project when I got a letter to come to the zoning meeting on June 12th. Otherwise, I had not been aware that Victorian Village had been meeting for several months on this project. Uh, some of the members of the Victorian Village Commission had questions about the size of the building. I wanted to make two points of many that concern me. One is I didn't understand the hardship. There's a requirement for a variance to zoning that a hardship exists. In the uh, application, it states for the hardship due to the urban environment. And I had no idea what that meant. Um, so all of the variances then would become moot if there's not a remedy to a hardship. Uh, Mr. Perry mentioned the wide lot, 93 feet. It also states that they want to s divide that and make a separate parcel for the 16-unit apartment building and the restored Victorian house. 
in part, I wish you could ask about the parking because it was very hard to understand. It sounded like they were going to have 12 spaces behind the office and they were going to count those, 10 of those, as part-time spaces for the 16-unit building, which was only going to have nine or something. It was very confusing. The other point I wanted to make was about the, the setback reductions which put the corner of the building within a foot on one side and a six inches on the other of an alley, which, excuse me, has become, they abandoned the alley straight through to High Street many years ago. Now it's a right angle alley. Trash trucks, delivery trucks, emergency vehicles, all have to make this sharp right angle with a building within a foot of this sharp corner. In addition, there's a daycare center which is accessed in the middle of the alley. People dropping off and picking up children. Some people walk their, their toddlers down the alley. In addition, there's a medical facility, which is also has a, a parking lot at the back of its lot, accessed mid-alley. So we have quite a bit of traffic coming and going in the alley, particularly morning drop-offs, people leaving for work, after work, picking up the children and coming home from work. One of the variances, may I continue a bit more? Uh, you could finish your point, but we uh, wrap it up quickly. One of the variances for reducing the lot coverage, a 16 unit building apparently, or any apartment building needs 50 feet and they have 40. So this building is too big, wouldn't fit on the lot except for nine variances on a 40 foot lot. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Uh, Mr. Perry, I have, um, I've got four points that he uh, mentioned that you can address and also staff. Um, his, his first question was dealing with the hardship Uh, certainly, every urban project, um, and we, we've been involved with many of them, has had variances. And the the underlying issue is a code that was written for suburban development, such as perimeter yard requirements, 25% of lot area behind the building, um, and, and other uh, suburban development requirements that are applicable to multifamily. Uh, they don't work in urban environments. Um, I, I can't think of any uh, substantive urban redevelopment project that has, had not, has not had variances before this council. Um, it's the nature of the beast in working with a code that is not designed for urban development or historic district development. Um, and this might be for the staff or that he mentioned the parking. Um, Tori, you want to address that? Sure. Um, the, the variance request is um, the required parking would be 12 spaces for the original structure, so the original office building, um, plus an additional 24 spaces for the residential uses um, for a total of 36 spaces. The applicant is proposing um, a total of 22 spaces for both the office and the residential uses, so the reduction is for 14 spaces total. Okay. Um, he also mentioned um, uh, the setback. Um, what he was kind of addressing dealing with with um, the alley um, either one of you can answer that the minimum side yard permitted um, in this district uh, requires the side yard to be no less than one-sixth of the height of the building that number is um, 6.8 feet the applicant is proposing a minimum side yard of 0 0.5 feet for the new apartment building along that east property line um, in the rear yard um, I don't know if the applicant wants to add anything else. So is, is staff's recommendation that that was okay with that, with that setback? We are supportive. Of okay, supportive. Um, do you have any other um, items to address, Mr. Perry, with, with the application? Um, one, 
one point or, or a couple points. The um, the speaker indicated that there are separate parcels. Um, there are not separate parcels. There there was that was the initial uh, concept with the project, but uh, SND Partners has elected to not have separate parcels uh, for the apartment building and the office building. It's it's on the um, they'll be on the same parcel. It makes the yard compliance issues work better. It makes the parking lot work better. So we are these are these will be two separate buildings on a 93 foot wide parcel. Okay. Did you present this to the Victorian Village um, Commission? Um, our, our client presented it. The client. Um, the, um, this, this project is uh, very far along with Victorian Village Commission review and approval. Um, the four, four, possibly five meetings with the Victorian Village Commission uh, covered both zoning but also architecture. And the, the Victorian Village Commission has approved the concept architecture for the project and um, told the architect to proceed with construction drawings. Um, and that uh, receiving concept approval of architecture from Victorian Village, Italian Village, German Village is, is no small accomplishment. Right. Um, and, as, and as part of that, uh, the, the rezoning and variance applications were reviewed, yes. And, okay. and there was uh, approval of both. Okay. And how long a period was that in presenting with your client in the time frame? Uh, oh, um, I, I would say, um, well, there was um, the, uh, the, our client and architect was on the July 10th Victorian Village Commission meeting for further discussion of architecture. Um, and the two prior meetings, May and June, the zoning was discussed in addition to architecture and probably two, two meetings Prior to the May meeting, they were discussing concept architecture and the project in general. So it, it's been going on for a number of months with the number commission. of months. Yeah. So okay. Any questions for my fellow council member? Council member Klein. Thank you, Chair. Uh, on the parking, are some of the spaces hybrid spaces in the sense that the businesses will use them during the day, the residents yes. will use them at the night? Okay. Yes, exactly. And then on the setback, this is for staff, um, do you take into consideration, uh, when you look at these setbacks, the speaker mentioned the alley, um, do you take into consideration refuse trucks and fire? Do they, do they come into play in making the determination that there's enough angular uh, space for those sort of larger trucks to make um, the moves in the alley? That's something we consider, and Refuge, off, Refuge also reviews the applications when they come in, so they had an opportunity to comment. And they've all signed off on this? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chair Miller. Council Member Craig. Chair Miller, uh, sir, uh, uh, what is your process for disseminating information? How does the residents get information uh, regarding well, the- Well, there, um, there are two processes. Um, the Victorian Village Commission uh, we are an applicant to the Victorian Village Commission, and they have their own process of, of how information is disseminated. Um, I, I don't think the Victorian Village Commission uh, sends individual notices, but their agendas are published. Um, the second process is the city process, where there is publication and direct mail notice of this meeting, for example, that, and the Development Commission meeting, and, uh, and notices were sent for those meetings. Thank you. Any other questions from uh, council members? Thank you, Mr. Perry. Oh, council member Mills. I think the question is for staff because I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Perry's explanation of hardship, but could you explain hardship? I'm not sure that the explanation is uh, clear enough. I, I think we've used a lot of industry terms that I think should further explain hardship to our speaker. Sure, um, we do require the statement of hardship to be submitted with the council variance application. Um, council members review that to determine if uh, there is a hardship. Um, staff reviews it as well. And um, in regards to the setbacks, um, yes, they have reduced setbacks, but if you can see from the site plan, they also have some yard area that is shown. And if they were to follow those setbacks, some of that yard area would not be able to be accomplished. Um, we defer to the Victorian Village Commission in this uh, instance and in, in when there's a historic commission review. If that board approves the request, city staff usually goes along with that uh, approval because they are appointed by the mayor and they're part of the city review process, essentially. 
I understand all of what you said, but I think the speaker is trying to understand a hardship is when there is difficulty placed on the developer to comply. I think the concept of what is a hardship is part of the, the explanation, not the hardship that we're talking about here. Does that make sense? And understand what is a hardship, and because the, you use suburban, but it talked about in reference to it being in an urban area, so just hoping that we would, what is a hardship versus what is the hardship being placed there and what is shared so that our speaker understands hardship. I, I could just add to that that just, you know, we, staff has determined that there is a practical difficulty with developing this property with the office building, with the proposed apartment building um, in this urban area. That Mr. Perry was correct in, in stating that there is a practical difficulty in being able to apply those various setbacks with, with a, a, a dense urban neighborhood. And these variances are very standard in those neighborhoods. Thank you. Um, um, any other questions from council members? Th thank you, Mr. Berry. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Becker, for coming down to the council. Um, we hope that we addressed your, your questions. You may be seated. And um, I'd like to um, um, next um, inform that through the, the zoning process, we do um, um, allow um, the public to not just voice their concerns at the commission meetings, but they also have the ability to contact my office with questions um, before it, it's actually presented to council. And actually they have the, the ability to contact any of the, the council members' offices with those questions. And we do encourage the public to contact us, um, you know, even prior, for, prior to the vote in order for us to, to deal with the issues at hands and also answer your questions prior to meetings in order for us to have a more efficient and productive discussion on, on your concerns. Um, but with this, from the, the amount of time that we trusted with the Victorian Village Commission and also with the staff um, and their expertise, I think um, at this point, um, I would like to go ahead and move for, for, for passage, but I would like to um, first amend um, as submitted to the clerk. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next, I'd like to amend to emergency. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. And um, lastly, move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next is 1644 2014 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3333.025. AR2 Apartment Residential District 3363.01, M Manufacturing District 3321.05A Vision Clearance, Sections 3333.09 Area Requirements, 3333.15 Basis of Computing Area, 3333.16 Fronting on a Public Street, 3333.18 Building Lines, 3333.22 Maximum side yard required, 3333.23A. Minimum side yard permitted, 3333.24. Rear yard, 3333.255. Perimeter yard and 3363.27B12. Height and area regulations of the Columbus City Code for the property located at 575 West 2nd Street to permit a 24 unit residential development comprised of eight three unit dwellings or attached single unit dwellings with reduced development standards in the AR2 apartment residential and M manufacturing district. The applicant is Roll Tallow Holdings LTD. The proposed use is multi unit or attached single unit residential development. And this received the city department recommendation for approval. And I have no speaker slips. If there are no questions or comments, I'd like to first to amend to emergency. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next, I'd like to move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 1655-2014 to amend ordinance 
uh, 59 2014 passed on June 2nd 2014 for the property located at 1635 South Hamilton Road by amending section 3 to reflect a correct proposed use and this received the City Department recommendation for approval and if there are no questions or comments I'd like to move for passage Craig Klein Miller Mills Bailey Tyson President Ginther next is 2063 um, 2013 in which I would like to first remove it from the table. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. To grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3389.07, impound lot, junkyard, or salvage yard of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 894 Frank Road to request a special permit from the Columbus Board of Zoning Adjustment for a salvage recycling operation in manufacturing district. Um, the applicant is Roof to Roof LLC. The proposed use is the salvage recycling operation. And on this original um, variance, this had the disapproval of the Southwest Area Commission and approval of the City Department recommendation. Um, and with this, we do have um, a new variance um, in which I would like to move for passage and request a vote, uh, request a no vote on this one. Second. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Bailey, Tyson, President Ginther. Craig? No. Klein? No. Miller? No. Mills? Paley? Tyson? President Ginther. 1604 2014 to grant an invariance from the provision of sections 3365.01. M1 Manufacturing District and 3389.07 impound lot, yard, junkyard, or salvage yard of the Columbus City Coast for the property located at 894 Frank Road to permit a salvage recycling operation in the M1 Manufacturing District in accordance with the special permit from the Columbus Board of Zoning Adjustment. And with this, we would like to first have a presentation from staff. Good evening. The applicant is requesting a council variance to allow a salvage recycling operation in the M1 Manufacturing District. The site is located within the planning area of the Southwest Area Plan, which recommends lower intensity light industrial uses for this location. At present, salvage yards are permitted only in the M Manufacturing District with a special permit from the Columbus Board of Zoning Adjustment. However, a proposed code change uh, is pending to allow this use to also be located in the M1 Manufacturing District with a special permit, and um, that is actually uh, scheduled on the regular agenda next week. Staff does not object to the proposed salvage recycling operation as a secondary use in the M1 District, which allows for the most intense manufacturing uses particularly given the restricted nature of the request in terms of space and location on the subject site. Approval of this request will not introduce a new or incompatible use to the area. The applicant will also be required to a special permit from the Columbus Board of Zoning Adjustment where additional conditions and limitations can be imposed. And there are uh, several conditions listed within this ordinance as well. And with that, staff is recommending approval and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, the applicant is, is Road to Road LLC, and um, this received the Southwest Area Commission recommendation of approval. Um, and with that, I would like to uh, invite Stephanie Coe from the Southwest Area Commission, as one of the commissioners, to um, explain their approval. I'm Stephanie Coe, 1397 Gorham Drive, Columbus, Ohio. I'm the chair of the Southwest Area Commission. Uh, President Genther, members of council, I'm here tonight to explain the work and ultimate recommendation of the Southwest Area Commission regarding this ordinance. Sorry. Um, so I wanted to give you kind of a little background into how this came to be and, and how our, our recommendation changed, basically, um, as this process has gone along. So basically, historically, code had cited this property for this, these issues prior to 2009 when court action was filed. Uh, we had no communication from the property owner or the business owner. The case lingered um, in court, and finally there was an agreed order to bring the property into compliance, and a rezoning application was filed. 
Um, Mr. Perry and his client, well, Mr. Perry appeared at our April 2013 meeting. Um, it wasn't really very productive. There wasn't a lot of information shared. The concerns from the community kind of escalated uh, when they weren't getting any information. They had questions about the type of shingles, whether they were asbestos-containing shingles, how that was impacting their water quality, air quality, and those kinds of things. Um, our opposition was pretty clear at that time. Um, they came back in August having ch changed their application from a rezoning to a council variance, which limited the scope of what they were asking for to the basically four and a half acres where the um, roof to road business sits. As you can see from the map, there's a large amount of parcels. I think there's actually three parcels involved, and this sits in one small section of that larger um, property. Uh, Steve Johnson, the owner of Roof to Road, appeared at that meeting. Um, I think he explained a lot of details and answered a lot of questions that had been lingering um, for, for community members and, and for commissioners. Ultimately, we still voted to oppose um, the council variance. And in the letter that we sent to city staff, there were basically a number of things that we noted that were positive, limiting the scope by asking for a council variance for that limited uh, part of the parcels, um, the fact that he was able to explain his business and, and the recycling component of not adding more waste to landfills was a positive, uh, positive aspect of that. Um, but we still had concerns about sort of the environmental issues, what was happening with respect to the water that may be getting into people's wells. Um, they indicated there was testing of the shingles. We hadn't seen any of that. Um, and then we were also told that the employees were trained to visually inspect shingles, which didn't exactly uh, make sense to us that you could do that. Um, so uh, we sent another letter in opposition, and the uh, matter was then heard again by Judge Hawkins um, in the fall of 2013. I don't remember the exact date, but I think it was in November. Um, and because of some previous orders, um, it was kind of at a standstill because the applicant had made progress, had, had applied to have a council variance, but um, nothing had been decided, so we kind of felt like we were stuck. Uh, Judge Hawkins asked for an on-site visit, which the owner agreed to. So in December of 2013, um, city staff, the judge, uh, myself, a number of other people uh, went out to the site and actually looked at the business. We did see the test results, binders of test results, um, where Mr. Johnson's business I don't want to speak for him, but as I understand it, basically their clients re require uh, proof that there's no asbestos in the shingles material that they're selling. So there's testing done, and he had binders of proof of that testing that he showed myself and the judge. Um, the training made a lot more sense when you were there, and the employees were able to show us the information that they had on the walls, that they had been trained. We were able to talk to some of those employees who'd been there for a long time. We were concerned that they were temps who maybe had never seen that kind of work before, but the gentlemen were able to explain why that wasn't um, the case. So um, we reheard the matter in 2014 um, after that visit. And there was a question earlier about notice, and just so you know, we give written notice. We mail postcards to all property owners within 125 miles, similar to the city's requirements. So all of these meetings, that notice was given. Uh, prior to having heard the matter again in 2014, I personally spoke to the EPA, um, which I'm happy to share the multiple details that they gave me regarding the issues if, if you'd like. Um, I also talked to code enforcement again. As, as we talked to the neighbors, as you can see, it's a large uh, number of parcels, and a lot of the complaints were things other than the roof-to-road business on that smaller parcel. There were complaints about the type of fencing used on the exterior of the property, there were complaints about mounds, uh, piles that you can see from some of the residences that are unrelated to roof to road. They happen to be on one of these three parcels, but they're not part of the roof to road business or the council variance. So um, code enforcement went out again and informed me that they didn't see any additional violations relative to, to those issues. So we had another lengthy discussion at our meeting. Um, I think there were still issues from the community that was clear. Many of them didn't have anything to do with this particular application. And ultimately, the area commissioners felt that we needed to work out a compromise so that something could be done to monitor the property. So we decided to add some conditions to our support, um, which those conditions are all contained in the ordinance uh, that you have tonight. And I, I thought it would be helpful just to kind of read quickly the motion that we supported. Um, and explain those conditions. Our idea that night of the meeting was to allow the communities to suggest conditions that they wanted to see, and we could ask for them. Maybe they wouldn't be granted, maybe they would. But um, this is what we came up with. 
and, and I'm going to skip some of it, but basically we recognize that the community is frustrated and so are we. This has been going on since prior to 2009. But specifically our conditions stemmed from um, limiting the duration of this variance um, and special permit to be 10 years. My understanding is that that could be done and it would be extended if they were to comply with all the different criteria, that they receive the permits that they're required to have, they fully comply, they continue to have the shingles tested and share that information with city staff as well as the EPA or I guess really anyone who asks for it, and they comply with our other conditions. Um, you can see in one of the pictures, actually that picture in the, I'm horrible at directions here, but in the top of that picture you can see there's trash. We wanted that removed and that any trash be contained so it isn't blowing throughout the community and uh, covered. We also asked that the height of the pile be limited to 30 feet. And uh, at the time we voted on this, the piles were approximately 30 feet. So we, we know what that looks like. And um, although specific parking areas can't be designated because of the way their business operates, the pile kind of moves. We wanted spaces designated for parking so that it was cleaned up and, and well organized. So ultimately the commission voted to support that motion and those conditions. And um, that's really how we got here tonight. So I'm happy to answer any questions or provide more details on what the EPA shared with me. Okay, great. We might, um, I might ask you some other questions after we have the presentation from the, um, the applicant, but also go through our uh, speakers. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, members of council, my name is Donald Plank. I'm the attorney for the applicant. I have been sworn in. I also have with me this evening Steve Johnson, the president of Roof to Road, to answer questions that you might have. I just want to point if I were to do an introduction, it would be the same as staff gave. Um, I know there's some opposition. I'd really prefer to hear what they have to say and then address those uh, if there's any questions that they raise. But I do want to point out that the only thing we're asking for is a variance from the M manufacturing district requirement so that we can go to the Board of Zoning Appeals and go through this process basically again. Only at that point, there'll be more detail, there'll be more evidence and more discussion. So, and we, by the way, agree with all the conditions that are contained in this ordinance. Uh, yeah, thank you for pointing that out about this is, is going to the BZA um, where they will um, have further discussion and details. Um, but at this time, we do have um, three um, speakers. Uh, our first speaker is Don Parsons. Uh, welcome to council. Um, please state your name and address and any organization that you represent, and you have three minutes. Um, thank you very much. My name is Don Parsons. I'm a resident of uh, Columbus. You want my address or? Well, 1253 Marsdale Avenue, Columbus, Ohio. Thank you. And this is really something. We, the people of our neighborhood, we want, we want the same opportunity to have a clean Columbus as anybody else. We have Mr. Steve Johnson that's moved his roofing shingle business into our area under the radar no permits he's under a code violation with the city of columbus right now basically he's not complied if anything he's bringing he has been bringing more shingles in over the years and this problem's been going on since 2009 the city of columbus cited him in 2009 for a code violation and He's told the city of Columbus repeatedly that he's going to leave. Well, this is a real problem because he's got a dump on a main corridor in the city of Columbus to where it's destroying quality of life, plus what he does with these tear off roof, roofing shingles. Roofing shingles, like, you know old used roofing shingles can contain asbestos. He doesn't have the correct testing. He told us, I asked him, well, how exactly do you test these shingles? Mr. Johnson said, well, they got a book and his trained temps look at them in the book and they determine which ones contain asbestos and which ones don't by looking at them. That's, that's an impossibility. The only way to detect asbestos con content in roofing shingles is they have to be placed under a microscope and looked at by a professional. That's outrageous to us that he would tell us something like that. 
We, the people of the city of Columbus, don't want mesothelioma or lung cancer. We don't want our children dying. We don't want bad things like that in our area. And we're 100% against any variance or waiver for inland products in this case. Uh, it's just astounding that these people would be asking this of us to lower our quality of life, lower, lower our standards, take away the opportunity for positive development that we want in the Frank Road Corridor, it's a main corridor. Yeah, who do you know that's gonna be wanting to build a good business next to a, a shingle grinding dump? I don't know of anybody. Columbus can do better than that. I'm asking the city council to vote against this. Um, <clears throat> something here else. Also, um, I would like to say, <coughs> could I say a few more words? A couple statements, you can say a statement. Okay, um, the Franklin Township trustees are overwhelmingly against this and the community was overwhelmingly against this, and the area commission voted for this against the will of all the people in the neighborhood. And we feel that that's not the way these uh, neighborhood associations should be Thank disrespecting. You. Thank you for coming Thank down. Thank you for your time. Um, I'm going to reserve my questions so after I have all the speakers come up. Um, our next speaker is Mel Melanie um, Copeland. Welcome to council. Uh, please state your name and address in any organization that you represent, and you have three minutes. Hi. Uh, my name is Melanie Copeland. I live at 1213 Brownleaf Road, Columbus, Ohio, and I represent the people of our streets, Brownleaf Road, Ingadine, all the streets that are connected with the uh, area where Rifter Roads is. We all are on well water. Uh, we ask that he test our wells and make sure that there is no asbestos or any chemicals from his grinding in our wells. He refuses to do that. Uh, from all the tests, it would be very, very expensive for each of our homes to have our own wells tested. We're not the ones making it. We moved there to live clean, to raise our children not to worry about cancer or something in our wells or something killing our children or giving them diseases. This man has been out of code, is that what you're, what I'm saying, hasn't complied for years. Why is all of a sudden he gonna start? We grant him a variance and then in a few years, he's going to want more and more and more until he's next door to my property. I don't want him there. Our children don't need him there. It's, it's not clean. And the Southwest Area Commission kicked us to the curb because they told us that they didn't want to bother with it anymore. And that's why they passed it. So what you were told was not completely true. And I'm standing up for the people that live there. Somebody has to. And I thank you very much for listening. Thank you for coming down. Um, our last speaker is John, I believe, Fleshman. Welcome to council. Please state your name and address in any organization that you represent, and you have three minutes. I'm John, I'm John Fleshman. <clears throat> 3471 Lowell Drive. I'm also a Franklin Township trustee. And I don't know if everyone, I can't, I can hold up a picture. I don't know if anyone's actually got to see the site. Um, looking at it from the overhead, I mean, from outer space, it, you can't see what 30, 30 feet of shingles actually look like. I was also attended uh, the Southwestern City Aero Commission, Commission, and Mr. Johnson did not answer the questions. I even asked questions. And one was the one, if he would be willing to test everybody's well, to get a baseline to see for sure where we are. 
these shingles do not have an apron underneath it to catch anything from going into groundwater. Um, channel six, I don't know if any of you have seen the, the, the footage on that, and they filmed from there, and all the water and debris laying around it from where they rinse it when they are grinding it. I have witnessed, um, as representing of the people on brown leaf in those areas, the dust particles and stuff that the people have on their houses and things of that nature where the wind carries it. If there is even a slight chance that this could cause any kind of cancer, this is almost like that movie where the girl become an attorney. This one life isn't worth the chance of them grinding shingles at this site. The look of the area, people have, it looks like a, a prison. There's a barbed wire fence, razor wires, right up alongside the fences, and then it basically stops and you could just walk around it. It was almost put up as if this was the thanks for making it tougher on us as a type of thing. As representative of Franklin Township, we would like to see the city find a better use for this. That, as you heard, it was a corridor. There is not going to be any good growth in that area if we allow that. As I watched the mayor fly around Columbus and say, looking over his left shoulder at the area that he was showing that's going to be thriving real soon. I really wish he could have dipped to the south just a little bit and would have been able to see the opportunities that could have come from the corridor of 71 and Frank Road. That it could be a new area of development. And also in that area, as you've seen, a lot of the new schools that are being built. Are our children going to be safe with the grinding of these shingles going in the air and no one knowing for certain? When they tested these shingles, from what I understand and I've been told, they pulled out three shingles out of a 30-foot pile of shingles, and I don't know how many feet long. How can you say that that was well tested? I think the city needs to table this or deny it. I would like to see it denied and really take a hard look before we put children's and residents' lives at stake here. And I thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Um, at this time, we have um, a chance for a rebuttal from the applicant, and I, I know that our, me and my fellow council member have a couple questions. But if I um, sum up with what the, the speakers were uh, wanted to get answers on, it was certainly dealing with the, the possibility of the, the shingles with uh, asbestos in it, and also uh, testing of the well water, um, and that was um, something that um, I know that Previously, what the Southwest Area Commission was dealing with was what to put the delay on even this coming to council over maybe even over a year ago. So could you address those? I'm going to defer any operational questions to um, Steve Johnson, the president of Roof to Road. Let me tell you how this initially started. When Mr. Johnson came to me with the violation orders, he said, look, these violation orders says I'm a junkyard. He says, I'm, I'm not a junkyard. I'm, I'm, I'm a recycling facility. Well, He's wrong because under the city code, he is indeed a junkyard, but that's a problem with the city code. I mean, we're trying to encourage recycling, and yes, yet the definition of salvage and junkyard is a 1950 to 1960 definition, and it doesn't work with the new recycling that we're talking about today. The, you know, for example, Mr. Johnson takes shingles. He shreds those down into a finished product. Those asphalt pellets then are sold and then taken off site and turned into asphalt. It's a really a, a manufacturing process. The old idea of a junkyard and salvage yard where people come in and actually give goods and sell them to the operator, where you have the concern about maybe stolen property, you have the concern about you know, where did this come from. In this case, my client actually gets paid for taking this material, turns it into a finished product, and then turns around and sells it then to Department of, uh, of ODOT. So the whole, pro and I've got other clients that take concrete and turn it into finished product, tires and finished product. It doesn't really fit what we call the salvage yard, and yet because of the old definition, it brings all those in and requires us to come to city council to get the variances that hopefully at one of these days the code changes that doesn't require this process. Granted, the special permit is a, is, is a process that works. Everyone gets to speak at the special permit. Evidence is presented. All these issues are, are, are talked about and discussed. But it really shouldn't be in front of this council each time. But that's my two cents. Yeah. So, if any I, I, I will have staff, though, respond to the, 
that we, I think we do have pending code changes. The code change to allow a salvage uh, recycling operation in the M1 district is um, was uh, submitted to council back in 2012 and is scheduled next week uh, for passage. Um, as far as recycling businesses being separated from needing a special permit, I think that is something that our code development team has looked into, but there isn't any active legislation for that aspect at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, we would like to have the... Um to still respond to the whole thing with the, the shingles and you know. My name is Steve Johnson. I'm president of Roof to Road LLC. My address is in the rear of 900 Frank Road. Council President Ginther, Zoning Chairman Miller, and other members of council. Um, so. To address the community's concern about the shingles, Bespis, what's, what are your procedures to really look at the, you know, in preventing the possibility of shingles being sh shredded that might have asbestos in it? Yes, there are uh, several safeguards as we follow our ODOT protocol and also protocol from the Ohio EPA. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the first one is the visual inspection as the materials are received. Uh, my people who are not temporaries are trained in the visual inspection. That is an ODOT protocol. Uh, we are also required to do random sampling of the finished product and submit them to an independent lab. Um, so does ODOT have a procedures of doing um on-site inspections or random throughout the year? I don't, I don't know the, what the yes, process is. Yes, um, before we were given our certifications, sir, uh, ODOT came on a couple of different occasions to check and see how we proceeded and how we kept our records. Uh, we also have uh, both regular and spot checks by the Ohio EPA. So do they also have the, the ability to um, to be concerned with the, the well water? That's a question that they have not raised since we're on a very, very small portion of an old landfill. Uh, they've felt that what moisture we do put out is in the form of a high pressure mist, and this captures any tramp or errant dust particles without causing runoff. Okay. Um, any questions from other council members? Council member Mills? I have a few, Chair Miller. Uh, my first question, if you can answer, uh, Mr. Johnson, is we talked about random shingle testing. Is there a ratio, like for several thousand? Because I, I noticed that one of the speakers referenced the huge amount and to test three. Is there some sort of standard protocol in terms of ratio that establishes what's random? Three out of a thousand is random. Is there a baseline for that? Uh, that was from the Ohio EPA, and they conduct spot uh, surprise checks, if you will, and that, that's within their own guidelines. Uh, per the ODOT protocol, we are required to test every week or every 300 tons of finished product material. Uh, so, no, ma'am, I, I don't know what the ratio is for them. Okay, but every 300 tons. It, yeah, that, that's okay. our, uh, we are. And, and the one of the speakers referenced, um, maybe it was uh, Mr. P Attorney Plain that talked about the material is being given to you and then you test it. Are there any requirements on the origin of the materials that come to your site? Any information related to the origin of those materials that, before they arrive to your site? Uh, yes, ma'am. Per the ODOT protocol, we have uh, point of origin uh, certificates that come in with each load. Uh, they are to come per ODOT protocol from dwellings, I believe, of less than uh, six family uh, dwellings. And then my other question is the other businesses that surround the parcel where 
roof to road e exists. I believe one of the speakers referenced the concerns of other potential development. I guess I'm just trying to get a sense of what, from a possibility standpoint, surrounds the other, the other three parcels that surround where roof to road is located. Uh, we are just north of the fuel stop and a few hundred feet from a truck repair shop and then there are two or three semi-trailer parking lots and then there are approximately 400 acres to our north that are mostly uh, I would call brush and then there is also uh, a recycled dirt pile that's approximately a quarter mile north of us. So as we stand at our site, the only visible business would be the truck repair shop and the trailer parking lot. And my last two questions, if you could respond to the, the comments made about code enforcement and then lastly, certainly not least, is the well water issue, and Chairman, maybe you can answer that. Uh, the well water issue something that would or could be addressed in and with the BZA? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, she wants you to address the code first and then I'll address the Oh, uh, why I was out of compliance. Uh, when I started, I got some very bad advice and I was naive to that part of the system. And that's why we're working very diligently to come into compliance. And certainly the well water issue can certainly be a, um, brought up with the BZA, but it's also something that um, I'm going to, um, after I ha have this gentleman sit down, have Stephanie Coe come back up to um, deal with where the EPA has been involved and Judge Hawkins. The other thing that I, I definitely want um, uh, Ms. Coe to address is the limitation um, that they put in the text that I think is very important to be, to be brought up. Um, but before that, do we have other questions from other council members? Uh, council member Paley? Just, uh, I was just going to ask that. I've, I've observed Ms. Coe's work before and she's a pretty ambitious um, attorney who doesn't leave much um, for questions. So I'd be interested in hearing um, what you have to say about the possibility of the EPA issues because I'm sure that that's been addressed. Councilmember Klein. Thank you, Chair. Could you please explain what the ODOT protocol is? Certainly. Uh, it's rather multifaceted, but in general, as you folks know, uh, we bring in the tear-off roofing shingles and then they are cleaned up because the ODOT protocol, part of it calls for less than one-half of one percent deleterious material in the final product. And that's very, very clean so that, uh, you know, there's no contamination to the asphalt. Uh, the rest of the gradation, the reason why we grind it and screen it down to where we are, it has to be uh, less than one-half inch gradation, 100% passing the half-inch screen with 85% passing the number four sieve. That gives it enough homogeneity to go through the average asphalt plant and be homogeneous enough to be brought in. Uh, the rest of the protocol in general uh, has to do with that we do uh, the asbestos testing, as I've mentioned before. It also has to do with the tear-offs coming from only dwellings, I believe, of uh, six people or less. So, so, so the ODOT protocol is a protocol put into place by the Ohio Department of Transportation who is a, a purchaser of yours of this product and in order for you to be in compliance with what they want to purchase you have to follow these regulatory steps to ensure that the asphalt that they're buying these pellets are in you know, the, the homogen, homogeneous components um, throughout the pellet itself is to their liking. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that is correct. And does the protocol call for, um, does, are there steps associated? I understand like that the, the composition of the shingles themselves must be of certain grades, but are there steps that must be required with the shingles themselves that the Ohio Department of Transportation requires? Um, and do you at all deviate from those steps? 
Uh, no, we do not deviate at all. We feel very blessed that we uh, are their first supplier here in Ohio as they do allow them now in state work. So uh, we rigidly follow them. Uh, they come in and visit and also spot check. Uh, they also uh, test the gradation and the cleanliness that I referred to. So the two components of this protocol is to ensure the cleanliness of the product but for, the, for asphalt itself, but also the safety of the product so that there are no contaminants. That is correct. And, and, and you don't deviate from any of those. So, so in order for you to have a purchaser like ODOT, which I'm sure is a significant purchaser given the fact that they maintain the Ohio highways, um, that the quality of your product is one where evidence would show that there is no contaminant, at least contaminants that we're discussing tonight, in your product. And if there were, you would lose the ability to sell to ODOT. That is correct. Okay, because I'm concerned, certainly share the concern of the folks here T testify, I would be concerned too. Um, however, I, I, it's, it's, it's challenging when, when, when folks are passionate about their issue, and I respect their passion, um, to, to, to differentiate the passion um, and what could be anecdotal evidence of concern versus the process and procedures of the actual evidence of the product itself. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to differentiate to determine whether the product itself is one that is going to meet the quality standards and try to take away the what I what could possibly describe as like the objective blinders because you you know certainly don't want asbestos in your groundwater or you don't want asbestos in the air. Uh, I certainly wouldn't want it. I know they wouldn't want it. Um, so really hammering home to the point that. Uh, the, the, the process that's put in place by the Ohio Department of Transportation and one that you don't deviate from uh, it guarantees a quality product that's not going to put those carcinogenic cancer-causing products um, into the atmosphere. And Mr. Klein, I uh, also wanted to interject. I believe there's another part of the protocol that limits us to processing on days when the wind is less than maybe 10 miles an hour so that we uh, do not have it going anywhere, although it would be impossible for it to because we spray the very, very fine mist to drop the dust particles. Yeah. That's all the questions I have for Mr. Johnson, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Koch, could you come to the podium? Thank you. Um, could you explain the limitation um, text that was um, um, that the Southwest have, have put into this? Because one of the things that the, one of the speakers did what, did bring up a concern with was um, size and also possible expansion. Right. Um, that was one of our concerns as well, um, that if the entire uh, three parcels were rezoned, then potentially any part of those parcels could request a special permit um, and, and potentially have other uh, salvage, recycling, whatever you want to call these kinds of operations. Um, so number one, the fact that the council variance has limited their operation to the four point five acres that they're requesting doesn't allow their business to grow and suddenly become 10 acres or 15 acres um, of those parcels, as well as our stipulation uh, and our um, conditions that it be uh, no additional, um, I'm trying to look at the language real quick, no other salvage permits be issued for any of the three parcels in the future um, and no expansion of the roof to road business. So it, it is our goal. and. Um, Members of the Area Commission have uh, been part of the uh, area plan planning process and are, are very focused on trying to help improve the community, in particular Frank Road, a major corridor. But uh, we, we came up with these conditions to recognize that the business is there and that if we don't come up with some uh, compromise, for lack of a better term, then there isn't compliance. They're continuing to operate without any compliance today and have been since 2009. But if we're able to move forward with this, then there are specific conditions that they would have to go get a permit and they would have to comply with the requests of the city and, and ultimately have to continue to operate within those boundaries. And if they fail to comply with those, there would actually be something that people could act on, whether it be code enforcement or the city attorney's office through court again. So we, we felt like the conditions would allow some supervision um, uh, and oversight of the business and, and limit uh, Ohio height, the expansion of the property and those kinds of things. Um, 
The only other comment I wanted to make was when the question was raised about neighbors, the underlying property owner owns all of that land. Um, so we're not talking about other property owners uh, in general. There are a few far away, but that whole um, large area that you see is owned by the same property owner. Um, so they're obviously aware of what's going on on this uh, parcel. Um, thank you. Um, uh, before we um, take it to a vote, I just have to, um, to thank um, Stephanie Coe for her work with the Southwest Air Commission on this, um, on this um, piece because of this reason. Um, as we go through the zoning process and even dealing with other area commissions, one of the things that we notice is that sometimes we have a, 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 a difference of procedures within the area commissions of how they, they run their meetings and whether they have a, a, even a, a zoning chair or even a, a zoning committee. But one of the things I had to, to commend the Southwest is what they did is they took their time to investigate and do their research of even contacting um, the environmental judge to the EPA and certainly our office and determine how we did table this and how they even approached uh, the other council offices. Um, and what Southwest was able to do is, is that they actually, um, which I, I kind of admire them for doing this, is that they reconsidered a piece of, 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 of a variance or a zoning that other air commissions um, have in their rules that they cannot. I think that's a, sometimes a disservice, not just to the applicants, but also to the public of them not looking at the possibility of new concessions being brought to the table by applicants doing a, a rezoning or a variance. So this actually creates a um, opportunity for, for others, Air Commission, to learn for what Southwest did and with the help with uh, what Stephanie Co did. But in keeping that in going back to this piece is that with all the work that has been done through the, the staff office and the, the applicant responding to not just the Southwest Air Commission, but also um, to our office, um, they have created the text here that I think is, is ideal for um, others who are looking at um, um, doing uh, certain expansion of their services, and we're talking about businesses, to really take the time um, to investigate and give us the opportunity as council members to really um, digest all the facts. Um, do we have any other comments from um, council member Paley? Well, I don't think we got an answer from Stephanie or anybody that there was some kind of testing that said that there was not asbestos problem and that it was not affecting the water. I mean, you said they discussed it with EPA, but... Stephanie, yeah. I don't want to speak specifically for the EPA, but I did contact them prior to our meeting and went over air issues, water issues. They were um, generally not aware of the concerns raised about water. Many of the complaints they had received were about air issues, which they don't believe there are any, and that they informed me that Roof Row was in compliance. What they told me was, with respect to water, that they had sent and do send people out to do spot checks. So the EPA went out and pulled some shingles. I believe it was three, from what I understand. Then they test those shingles. Um, and didn't find any asbestos at that time or anything else that, that caused a concern from their perspective. Um, they also explained to me, uh, they had a geologist explain to the lady who explained to me that um, what type of uh, what asbestos particles are and how they're insoluble in water and how that would potentially get into the ground out there that's basically made up of, um, uh, I think it's sand, and I don't want to get this wrong, but um, she explained the type of... Uh, ground, the gr uh, grout, dirt, whatever you want to call it, um, and that they, they didn't think there was a specific issue. So they had not found any evidence of a problem. And, and to my knowledge, no one has found any evidence of a problem. So ultimately, we took the word of the EPA sort of not identifying there being any issues. Obviously, I don't think any of us are sitting here guaranteeing that there's not something that has asbestos or doesn't. I, I obviously didn't test all the shingles, but um, from their protocol, their processes, they uh, indicated that Roof to Road was in compliance with anything the EPA had looked at. Council Member Tyson. Thank you, Chairman um, Miller. Stephanie, you know, since you had some residents that are here from your district, from your, from your area, the Air Commission. I'm just wondering um, what's been the process to just kind of share information with um, the residents of, of 
your area commission because obviously the three people here were quite concerned about the information that you shared with us today. And so just wondering what your process been to of sharing from this ongoing information with them since there has been a change of heart based upon the area commission. Sure. Um, I guess formally, like, as I said earlier, we give written notice. I send postcards to anyone that lives within 125 miles, the same group of people that get uh, uh, development commission or um, city council notices. So prior to each of our meetings, I sent those notices to all the property owners, um, which impacted uh, at least um, Ms. Copeland, I believe. And we also, um, uh, they, they were all in attendance at our meetings, um, so they were aware um, through the agendas ahead of time and then ultimately the action that was taken, all the discussions. Mr. Parsons attends all of our meetings. Uh, I believe Mr. Fleshman is a new uh, township trustee, but he was at the last meeting when we discussed this, and Ms. Copeland has been at a number of our meetings when we've discussed this as well. We share information via website, um, and anyone who wants to be on an email list, I share information via email as well. Any other questions? Go ahead. You can go to the podium. Yeah. Uh, a bit of a follow-up to what Ms. Coe was talking about in terms of uh, the migration of the asbestos. Um, since it's an old landfill, it was closed with layer after layer of clay. And as you all probably know, uh, clay is one of the most impervious of types of soil that there is. So it probably has two to three times the amount of clay layers that ordinary soil would. I've also been told that you could actually eat asbestos and it probably wouldn't hurt you because it would go on through the digestive tract where asbestos becomes a problem is in the breathing because I believe the particle is of such that it attaches to the lung and becomes a carcinogen. And I just wanted to add that. Okay. Thank you. Um, if there's no other questions, um, um, I think that from what um, we've heard tonight in the presentations from um, the applicants and the speakers and the Southwest um, Area Commission, and especially from the staff and their in their recommendations, um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and uh, move for passage. And um, I need to know from my other councilman: Do I need a voice vote, or do we just move for passage? I uh, will just move for passage then. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. And that is all we have in zoning tonight, President Ginther. Thank you, uh, President Pro Tem Miller. Nothing else uh, to come before zoning this evening. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Regular meeting number 41 is adjourned. Entertain a motion to reconvene regular meeting number 40. Is there a second? Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. We are re reconvened in regular meeting number 40. I'm going to ask for uh, the indulgence of my colleagues and ask. Uh, uh, to go to rules and reference and ask uh, Council Member Klein, who I believe has a couple of pieces of consideration, and then I'll bring forward some before we return to our regular agenda. Uh, Council Member Klein. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, in rules and reference on page 28 of your agenda, two pieces of legislation that are companion pieces dealing with peer-to-peer -peer, uh, operation in the city of Columbus. Uh, the first is 1376-2014 to amend Title V of the Columbus City Code by enacting new Chapter 588 entitled Peer-to-Peer -peer Transportation Network Company License and Chapter 590 entitled Peer-to-Peer -peer Transportation Network Driver's License to establish licensing requirements and regulations for peer-to-peer -peer companies and their drivers. Uh, I, I have two speakers. Um, I'd like to have the speakers um, come forward and speak first. 
uh, and then I'll offer some comments of, of the process that we've gone through. Uh, Council President, it's, it's somewhat of an awkward situation here with the speakers because there's two pieces of legislation, two speakers. Uh, they've both signed up um, to speak in opposition. If, it, if you're okay with it, I'd like to give each speaker six minutes, two, min or two portions of three minutes for both pieces of legislation if the speaker wishes to do that instead of taking them three minute increments at a time when both pieces of legislation are the same. Is that fine with you, Council President? The first speaker is Morgan Kaufman. Welcome to Council, Mr. Kaufman. Uh, if you Thank just could you. state your name, the organization you represent, and uh, you'll have two three-minute segments to address Council on this piece of legislation. I'll be brief. Thank you. Um, my name is Morgan Kaufman, and my family has been operating Yellow Cab of Columbus since 1928. I live at 730 Fairway Boulevard in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, thank you, Council Member Zach Klein and Michelle Mills, uh, the Office of Safety, and specifically Amanda Ford. Uh, we work with over 200 taxi drivers and understand what's at stake with these ordinances on the table tonight. From a safety perspective, Yellow Cab believes you've done a thorough job in vetting the peer-to-peer -peer insurgents. I stand before you to illustrate some of the nuance of the peer-to-peer -peer market threats to the taxi industry as a whole. Number one, with surge pricing, peer-to-peers can charge whatever they want for a predetermined fare. Taxis are relegated to city restrictions. Number two, with no-show fees, peer-to-peers can pay drivers for gas and time that was used even though the passenger changed their mind about the ride. Taxis incur those expenses without relief. And number three, with minimum charges, peer-to-peers are covered even for the shortest rides, while taxis can only charge, once again, what the city regulates. The argument that taxis still can pick up street hails and peer-to-peers cannot sounds good, but the numbers do not come close to even the financial playing field in Columbus. Our records indicate the electronic hail from a smartphone is actually replacing the street hail from a convenience perspective. Yellow Cab's goal has always been to serve Columbus's transportation needs. Please do not take away our ability to compete in a fair marketplace. There is very little difference in the actual service from peer-to-peer -to, -peer to taxis. We have had an app for years to prearrange transport, as well as text, GPS tracking, call and dispatch, and online booking. We even have digital video cameras in our vehicles for everyone's protection. To say these new companies are new is not correct. We have more technology in each of our vehicles and are required to accept all forms of payment. To turn this vehicle for higher industries, Apple Card on its side, for peer-to-peer -peer companies who disrupt, mislead, and carry on in our city, even though they have been asked not to, seems premature. Please vote today to professionally study what Columbus's vehicle for higher needs are and only then make a decision to regulate them into policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. May have had some questions. Do you have any questions for Mr. Kaufman? Okay. You're, you're okay? Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is uh, Jeff Cates. Again, sir, you'll have two, three minute segments. Thank you for coming down to council. If you just could state your name, organization. Sure, thanks for the opportunity. My name is Jeff Cates, um, president of Yellow Cab of Columbus, member of the Vehicle for Hire Board. I live at 6152 Sowerby Lane, Westerville, Ohio. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to address city council today. Uh, Yellow Cab has, has really appreciated all the efforts all the work, all the questions, all the meetings uh, that, we've, that have taken place. I know uh, Councilwoman Mills started this probably over a year ago, and, and here we are still talking about it today. Um, it's a complicated subject, and, and as a result, there's a lot of discussion that needs to take place. Um, we do appreciate all the thought that went into this. Um, we, Yellow Cab is an open book. Uh, we're part of uh, Columbus, Ohio since 1928 and we'll continue to share everything we can uh, as we're the largest uh, um, transportation company right now in the city. 
So anything we can do to, to help and answer questions that folks might have about uh, any specifics when it comes to uh, vehicles for hire, um, Yellow Cab is there and, and, and hoping to be a, a part of the solution. Um, we are all working hard to try and do our best for the great city of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we, we do believe there's still more work to be done before the no, new codes can be approved in everybody's best interest. Um, we're all looking at ways to improve transportation options uh, and for folks trying to get around our city. The industry is regulated. There is some regulation right now for the best interest of public safety and with an emphasis on serving the entire community. There's no, uh, there's no question Columbus will be better off with more vehicle for hires on the street. Over the last year, Columbus has added um, about 130 vehicles or uh, an increase of about 20% more vehicles on the street right now. Uh, that brings the total to over 700. Um, I hope we can all agree that this is a good first step. Um, but now, how can we continue to meet the city's needs while keeping the playing field as level as possible for all vehicle for hires? Um, the new codes allow the new peer-to-peer ride-sharing transportation network companies the ability to uh, lower and raise prices at a moment's notice with no limit on how much the customer can be charged. These companies have the right to, char uh, to charge a higher minimum while only allowing customers with credit cards to use their services. Additionally, these new groups of vehicles can charge a fee to customers if they're not at the requested pickup location called a no-show fee. Um, the 530 licensed taxis currently servicing Central Ohio are required to take a lot of different payment forms. Cash and credit card are the two, are the two main ones, obviously, to allow uh, for, all, for everybody to benefit from the services that, that we do offer. Um, taxis are limited by how much they can charge and cannot change the rates without, um, without uh, a city inspection fee of $31 per vehicle. Um, and, and that takes days and weeks um, of really coordination in the event that we did want to adjust pricing in that way. Um, you, know, our, you know, when demand is at its peak, taxes are still limited at that $2.02 per mile limit. Um, these are a couple of really important areas that put uh, the taxis at a disadvantage when competing for drivers and passengers. Drivers do not have to accept cash. Um, you know, when drivers don't have to accept cash, they're safer. I mean, they're, they're, they're out there providing a safer service, and, and that's going to, as a result, be a more attractive option when you're competing for drivers and trying to provide whether taxi service, peer-to-peer, -peer, livery. So that's a disadvantage for the taxi. Um, by, low, by raising and lowering prices at a moment's notice, customers can benefit from lower prices when business is slow, and drivers can benefit uh, by raising prices when demand is high. Those are, those are challenges that, uh, that the taxi industry is facing and, and trying, to, trying to figure out. Um, I know, you know, what, what we've talked about is this is always a work in progress. And, and, and there's, I know there's meetings and, and plans to continue to evaluate and review this. I just want to get, get some of these issues out there for discussion, making sure that we keep these in the forefront um, as we continue to evaluate what we're doing here um, with the vehicle for hire industry. Another area of consideration is, is the insurance side of things. Um, you know, we talk about adequate insurance. Is 24-7 insurance the way to go uh, to protect the, the, the citizens of Columbus. And in other cities, um, these new companies are offering the 24-7 uh, insurance. So I certainly would expect Columbus to benefit from the, from the uh, more inclusive, all-inclusive insurance options as well. So those are a few of the points that I just wanted to share. And once again, Yellow Cab of Columbus, we've been around since 1928. We're going to be around for a lot longer, and we want to help any way we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cates. Any questions for Mr. Cates? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, let me first uh, thank Mr. Kaufman, uh, Mr. Cates, uh, the folks from ACME. I see Hobdi back there. If you want to stand up and be recognized, sir, uh, from the Independent Cab Association, uh, who has sat at the table as we have drafted this legislation, really from day one since I've taken over the helm of safety. And I, I certainly appreciate and value uh, your input and in what we've done to craft what I believe to be sensible legislation. 
Uh, certainly, I want to thank the city attorney's office as well as Amanda Ford from the Department of Public Safety who has worked arduous, arduously on this particular piece of legislation. Uh, and the folks from Demotech, um, who I know are here today, I see Mr. Stenziano, thank you for coming. Uh, they've been a, a constant evaluator of you know, our insurance uh, our insurance scheme uh, and, and have indirectly uh, evaluated some of the peer-to-peer -peer companies, at least in, in an informal way, um, their, their insurance. Um, and they'll continue to be that provider for us um, as we move forward when um, licenses are, are eventually going to be issued. Um, I think this is um, a sensible and reasonable uh, piece of legislation that um, recognizes and appreciates the similarities and differences between what peer-to-peers offer and what taxi cabs provide. Uh, as Mr. Cates and Mr. Morgan uh, Kaufman uh, recognize, though, it's an ever-changing landscape. Uh, and, I've, and as we've gone through this, it's, it's really like a game of whack-a-mole. Uh, once you figure out something out, something else comes up because the landscape is really that fastly changing across the country from an insurance perspective. I feel comfortable from a public safety perspective, not only that the drivers and the vehicles will go undergo rigorous inspection and background checks, um, similar to what cabs and, and taxi cabs are doing, uh, but also from an insurance perspective that from start to finish, once someone turns on and wants to be a peer-to-peer -peer driver uh, to the point where someone's in the car till that person exits the car that there will be adequate insurance coverage. There'll be no gaps in the coverage. There'll be seamless protection to protect the public, protect the driver, protect the person in the unlikely event of an accident that, that gets into an accident with the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, driver as well as the person just walking down the street uh, and minding his or, own, his or her own business. Uh, so I, I again want to just uh, close in saying the thank yous again because this has been a long and difficult process. It is a work in progress and there'll be more work to done and I'm pledging to the cab association, both uh, Yellow Cab and the Independents and ACME, um, that we will evaluate this on a continual basis uh, and as different situations arise across the country and the landscape continues to change, we will change in Columbus. I'm flexible and we want to have the best product out there, the best legislation out there that matches the realities of the world we live in but at the same time protect consumers in a regulatory scheme that's fair to the businesses that are competing. Uh, so with that said, I do have one amendment that I want to add to this piece of legislation uh, and this, pe this amendment um, deals with collision insurance. Um, that is required um, by the peer-to-peer -peer company uh, and it simply just adds a $50,000 cap to it because it, it came to my attention that it's hard for an insurance company to quantify and price an insurance model based on an unlimited cap. Um, so I, I am adding a $50,000 um, collision amendment. Um, so I'm going to first move request to amend to submit it to the clerk. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. And I'd like to give my colleagues an opportunity to speak if they wish. Councilmember Mills. Thank you, Chairman Klein. I just have one comment, uh, and that is to um, say my appreciation to you and continue the importance on insurance pieces related to this legislation and the changes in vehicle for hire. So that's all I wanted to add. Thank you, Councilmember Mills. Any other questions or comments? I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next is 1377-2014 to amend sections 585.01, 585.03, 585.04, 585.05, 585.06, 585.07, 585.09, 585.11, 585.12, 585.13, 585.15 .15 of the Columbus City Codes to enact section 585.051 of the Columbus City Code in order to include peer-to-peer -peer transportation network companies and drivers as vehicles for hire. I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President, get there. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Klein. Tonight in rules and reference, I have three ordinances that will allow us to take action on the recommendations of the Columbus Charter Review Commission. Since the mayor and I created the commission in April, these esteemed community leaders have conducted a comprehensive and public review of the city charter. The Commission's recommendations are the product of many hours of public meetings and discussion. If approved by Columbus voters, the Commission's recommendations will modernize our city charter so that it better reflects the values and priorities of our citizenry. 
These updates will make city government more efficient, accountable, and responsive to its residents. Four of the five commissioners are here with us this evening, and we'll be hearing from them in just a few minutes. I'd like to thank our co-chairs, State Representative Michael Curtin, Ms. Marcelle Moore, as well as Commissioner Jeff Cabot. Commissioner Don Tyler Lee is unable to be with us tonight, but we're grateful for her service as well. And of course, we appreciate the work of our esteemed auditor, Hugh Dorian, who's done a few uh, tours of service on charter review commissions throughout the years. The ordinances before us request that the boards of elections of Franklin, Delaware, and Fairfield counties place three charter amendment questions on the November 4, 2014 ballot. Each ordinance would modernize the charter in a specific area. Ordinance 1747-2014 pertains to city administration, 1748-2014 to city elections, and 1749-2014 to city office holders. Contained in each ordinance are specific recommendations to improve the efficiency, accountability, and responsiveness of city government. This time, I'd like to invite co-chairs uh, Curtin and Moore and uh, Commissioner Cabot to uh, join us at the podium up front here. Good evening, President Ginther and members of council. Uh, it has been an absolute honor to serve on the commission. I am grateful to Mayor Coleman and to President Ginther for entrusting this important work to us. I think the commission was very deliberative and has put forth very strong recommendations that will benefit the citizens of Columbus. I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, the mayor's staff and council staff because their work was outstanding and greatly aided in our work. And I'm also grateful to the citizens of Columbus that attended our meetings and submitted uh, comments for our consideration. They were also very helpful. Um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions, but again, just thank you for uh, entrusting this important work to us. It has been an honor to serve. Thank you, President Ginther, uh, members of council. It has been a pleasure. Uh, we had, um, uh, interesting and uh, extensive give and take and learn much from each other. Uh, although I must say we learned most probably from uh, Auditor Dorian, who I think has forgotten more about city government than any of us ever knew. Uh, but uh, I spent a stint here a long time ago and um, I, I think your charter's in good shape. I think uh, it's served the community well for a hundred years and we have some suggestions for improving it uh, just a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Ginther, Ginther, members of council. It was a privilege to serve, uh, even though uh, we came to this task thinking we knew quite a bit about the charter. Uh, you always learn a heck of a lot more than uh, you think you possibly could. Uh, the 19 recommendations that are being incorporated in these three issues, uh, I believe, uh, would go a long way toward bringing the charter up to the 21st century standard that we all uh, desire for it. And I think uh, the five commissioners within uh, uh, our capacities would be more than happy to serve uh, between now and November to help explain, to help um, engage the citizenry to explain why we recommended what we did to the extent we can help carry the message uh, to the voters for their informed decision making on November 4th, we'd be happy to do so and we'd be happy to answer any questions uh, that you may have. Mr. Dorian, any uh, comments you'd like to make? Uh, Mr. President, just to thank you for uh, asking me to serve in this role, and I'd add to these other comments, I was most proud of the methodology used in this process. It was so wide open and so open to public comment, uh, television, et cetera, et cetera, and I think that's something special about this community we live in, and I would hope that uh, Columbus would always entertain that open dialogue, whether we agree or disagree. I think that's so fundamental to good government. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dorian. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, any comments or questions from council members uh, for the commissioners uh, before we entertain the legislation? Council Member Klein. Just briefly, Council President Ginther, uh, to go on record and thank the uh, folks that spent their time volunteering uh, to uh, modernize our charter and uh, certainly thank staff for the work they did. 
Any other comments? Councilmember Tyson. Uh, thank you, President Ginther. I, too, just want to say again, thank you for serving on this commission. And I really do appreciate the comments that were made at the last hearing about uh, in regards to the openness of um, allowing our residents to come down and share their comments and that oftentimes maybe maybe um, those comments were not ones that everyone could agree upon but there was still an opportunity for people to share share how they feel about the charter and changes that should be made and I really do appreciate that as you said the civility of the individuals that came down and shared their information that you that the, the five of you took the time to listen to that information and then to make sure that um, the, their thoughts and opinions were um, you know that you consider them as you as you get as you made the recommendations that you're having today. I also just really appreciate that. And if an individual does want to um, put a, a a ballot initiative together, that I appreciate that this particular commission made sure that everyone understands the proper way to do that, and so that we don't have those concerns moving forward as you've had in the past. So just appreciate all the work that you've done. I know it's taken you away from your families to be able to volunteer, even sitting here tonight for the length of this meeting. So just truly appreciate your work, and I'm sure the residents of our city would say thank you for your work also. Thank you. Thank you, President Ginther. Thank you, uh, commissioners, uh, for your service, uh, all your work, and the recommendations you've put forward to us. Uh, our city will be better because of it. So thank you. Thank you for your service. First piece of legislation is uh, 1747. 2014 to submit to the electors of the city of Columbus at a special election to be held concurrently with the regular general election on November 4, 2014. The question of amending the charter of the city of Columbus, such a question to be known as proposed charter amendment number one, city administration. First of all, would like to request to amend as submitted to the city clerk. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. It's amended. Move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. Next is 1748-2014. To submit to the electors of the City of Columbus at a special election to be held concurrently with the regular general election on November 4, 2014, the question of amending the charter of the City of Columbus, such question to be known as proposed charter amendment number two, city elections. First of all, would like to request to amend as submitted to the city clerk. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Amended. Now, no conversations or question. Move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. Finally, 1749-2014, to submit to the electors of the city of Columbus at a special election to be held concurrently with the regular general election on November 4th, 2014, the question of amending the charter of the city of Columbus, such question to be known as proposed charter amendment number three, city office holders. First, I'd like to uh, move to amend as submitted to, the, as, move as, as amended as submitted to the city clerk. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Amended. Any questions, comments? Move for passage. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. Passed. We will uh, return to our agenda, and I believe we are in utilities. Councilmember Klein chairs the Utilities Committee. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President Ginther. Um, uh, several pieces of legislation tonight in public utilities, um, many of which uh, have to do with Blueprint Columbus. I'd like to give Director Davies the opportunity to give us an update on, on what is going on in Blueprint. Chairman Klein, President Ginther, members of Council, thank you. Uh, we've talked a few times uh, to each of you about Blueprint Columbus, which is our plan to use green infrastructure in place of large tunnels uh, to meet the requirements of our two consent decrees with the Ohio EPA. Uh, we currently have a pilot program in Clintonville and also at the site of the old Southside Settlement House. And we would like to do a second pilot uh, in the Linden area. And we were breaking that down into 
uh, four different areas. So there's four pieces of legislation for that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the fifth piece of legislation is actually for a, uh, a lining contract. We evaluate sewers and if we feel that they can be repaired but not necessarily replaced, we go ahead and line them, uh, saving the ratepayers dollars and also uh, strengthening the integrity of the, of the pipe. So that's what those five are for. Uh, thank you, Director Davies. Any questions for the director about Blueprint before we get to the specific pieces of legislation? Okay. First up is 1276-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into an agreement for professional engineering services with Hazen and Sawyer for the Blueprint Linden Artane Parkwood area project to transfer within and expend up to $1,299,972.06 in funds from the Sanitary Sewer System General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2014 capital improvements budget. I move for passage. Second. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next is 1277-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into an agreement for professional engineering services with HDR Engineering Inc. for the Blueprint Linden Oakland Park Medina area project to transfer within and expend up to uh, $1,599,706.01 in funds from the Sanitary Sewer System General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2014 capital improvements budget. I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next is 1278-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into an agreement for professional engineering services with CDM Smith, Inc. for the Blueprint Linden Agler uh, Burrell area project to transfer within and expend up to $1,599,336.26 in funds from the Sanitary Sewer System General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2014 capital improvements budget. I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 1279-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into an agreement for professional engineering services with Gresham Smith and Partners Ohio Inc. for the Blueprint Linden Hudson McGuffey Area Project to transfer within an expend of up to $2,199,868.64 in funds from the Sanitary Sewer System General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Budget. I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 1379-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to modify the Professional Engineering Services Agreement with Hazen and Sawyer for the Jackson Pike Wastewater Treatment Plant Biosolid Land Application Improvement Project to transfer within and expend up to $1,046,500 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund and to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Budget. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Second. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 1413-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to execute a construction contract with Underground Utilities, Inc. for the Regina Avenue Area Water Line Improvements Project in an amount up to $2,553,515.40 for the Division of Water and to authorize an expenditure up to $2,553,515.40 within the Water Works Enlargement Voted Bonds Fund. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Second. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 1415-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to execute a construction contract with Shelley and Sands, Inc. for the East Field Drive Area Water Line Improvements Project in an amount up to $2,164,955.30 for the Division of Water and to authorize an expenditure up to $2,164,955.30 within the Water Works Enlargement Voted Bond Fund. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Okay. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Kinther. 1442-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to execute a construction contract with Travco Construction, Inc. for the 2014 Main Line Valve Replacements Project in an amount up to $2,195,281 for the Division of Water and to authorize a transfer and expenditure up to $2,195,281 within the Water Works Enlargement uh, Voted Bonds Fund and to amend the 2014 capital improvement budget. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 1496 2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a planned modification with Ohio Malts for services in connection with the Deep Row Hybrid Poplar Program for the Division of Sewage and Drainage and authorize the expenditure of $1,050,000 from the Sewage System Operating Fund. Uh, Director Davies, could you shed some light on this? 
Sure, Chairman Klein, President Ginther, members of council. Uh, our wastewater treatment plants, when they produce biosolids, there's three ways for us to, to uh, dispose of them. One is to incinerate them, uh, the second is to use our compost facility, and the third is uh, we pay someone to take it and they use it for uh, land application. In this instance, Ohio Mulch has a farm in New Lexington, Ohio, that they use uh, the biosolids, which are heavy in nitrogen, to uh, grow poplar trees. And the, they grow much faster with, with our product. And as a result, they harvest that and uh, make mulch and sell it. Terrific. Any questions or comments for the director? I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Dyson, President Ginther. 1507-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to modify the existing agreement and add an additional 40 months to the original end date of August 2014 with AEP Retail Energy for streetlight generation and transmission services and to declare an emergency. Director. Uh, Chairman Klein, this is our contract. Uh, we buy energy to light all the streets in the city of Columbus uh, from AEP Retail. Uh, we also buy the larger uh, amount of electricity that we did early in the year for our customers. So this is just... Uh, extending an existing contract with AEP to purchase power for our streetlights. Okay. i first like to remove from the table with a voice vote. Second. Craig? Yes. Klein? Yes. Miller? Yes. Mills? Paley? Tyson? Yes. President Ginther? Yes. Move for passage the same. Second. Craig? Yes. Klein? Yes. Miller? Yes. Mills? Paley? Tyson, yes. President Ginther. Yes. Next is 1514-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a construction contract with United Survey Inc. for the Blueprint Linden Lining Project to expend up to $3,048,006.50 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund for the Division of Sewage and Drainage. I move for passage. Second. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. 1516 2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to execute a construction contract with George J. Eigel and Company for the Hoover Reservoir Erosion Control Smothers Road Embankment Stabilization 2013 project in an amount up to $1,237,387.80 for the Division of Water to authorize the transfer and expenditure of up to $1,237,387.80 within the Waterworks Enlargement Voted Bond Fund and to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Budget. Any questions or comments? I move for passage by voice vote. Second. Craig? Yes. Klein? Yes. Miller? Yes. Mills? Paley? Yes. Tyson? Yes. President Ginther? Next is 1552-2014 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a construction contract with McDaniels Construction Corporation for the Dublin Avenue Control Building Site Improvements Project for the Division of Power and to authorize the transfer of up to $1,892,974.80 to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Budget and to authorize the expenditure of $4,152,974.80 and to declare an emergency. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. The final piece is 1608-2014. To authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into a professional engineering services agreement with Black & Veatch Corporation for the Division of Sewer, Sewage and Drainage for the Southerly Wastewater Treatment Plant Biosolids Land Application Facility Project to expend up to $3,221,708 from the Sanitary Sewer General Obligation Bond Fund to amend the 2014 Capital Improvements Budget and to declare an emergency. Director. Uh, Chairman Klein, President Ginther, members of council, uh, the earlier piece of legislation where I discussed uh, the three ways that we dispose of our biosolids, uh, one is incineration. Uh, we are looking to uh, eliminate incineration and go to a more environmentally friendly disposal, such as the one I described to you earlier. And this contract is to hire someone to design uh, how that might look in terms of storage facilities, transportation, uh, partners and all of that before we uh, take them offline. To move away from incineration and put the biosolids into storage for um, more environmentally sound disposition? Correct. Okay. Any questions or comments? I move for passage. Second. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. That wraps up utilities, Council President. Thank you, uh, Council Member Klein. Our next committee is the Public Service and Transportation Committee. President Pro Tem Miller chairs the committee. Mr. Chairman, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, President Ginther. In the Public Service and Transportation Committee, we have 1389-2014. This ordinance authorized the city attorney to file complaints to appropriate the remainder fee simple title and lesser real property interests necessary for the City Department of Public Service, Division of Design and Construction, Arterial Steep Street Rehabilitation, Hard Road Phase, A, Sawmill Road, Smoky Road, Smoky Row Road, public project authorize the city attorney to spend funds from the city department of public service federal state engineering fund fund number six seven sixty five and declare an emergency if there are no questions or comments i move for passage craig klein miller mills paley tyson president ginther 1625 2014 to authorize and direct the city auditor to transfer funds and appropriations within the streets and highways bonds fund to authorize and direct the city auditor to transfer funds between the streets and highways bonds fund and the federal federal state highway engineering fund to appropriate funds within this federal state highway engineering fund and the general government grants fund to authorize the director of public service to enter into a contract with shelley and sand incorporated for resurfacing urban paving sr 317 State Routes 317 Hamilton Road project to expend up to two million six hundred seventy one thousand seven hundred eighty dollars from the Streets and Highways Bond Fund and Federal State Highways Engineering Fund and the General Government Grants Fund to contract and construction administration and inspection services in connection with the resurfacing urban um, paving State Route 317 Hamilton Road project and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. And the next three ordinance um, is requesting waiving competitive bidding. I will request Director Davies to briefly explain these. And the key word is briefly. <laughs> Chairman Miller, President Ginther, members of council, uh, the first piece, 1656-2014, is authorizing public service to enter into a contract with emh and for final design for Cannon Drive realignment. emh and was initially competitively selected by The Ohio State University to complete the preliminary engineering phase of the project. Public service is going to hold the contract for the final design phase and recommends using the same firm that completed the initial design for cost and time efficiencies. Second piece of legislation, 1662-2014, is authorizing public service to enter into contract with GPD Associates for roadway improvements on Livingston Avenue from front to forth. GPD is currently under contract with ODOT for design work on phase 4A of the 7071 Livingston Avenue project, which will modify traffic on Livingston Avenue. The city's project design must be coordinated with ODOT's design for successful implementation. Therefore, we recommend using the same consultant. And the final piece, 1687-2014, allows finance and management to enter into contract with farmers, refuse, and trucking for the option to purchase up to eight cubic yard, up to eight cubic yard front load refuse containers. The load bid was non-responsive due to exceptions taken on pricing, language, and delivery requirements. All bids were non-responsive due to minor exceptions taken on the container dimensions. The purchasing office, along with public, ser public service, have reviewed all the bids and found the container specified from the second to lowest bidder to be acceptable and suitable for city use. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, thank you, Director Davies. Um, the first one is 1656-2014 to amend 2014 capital improvement budget to authorize the city auditor to transfer cash and appropriation between projects within the streets and highways bonds fund to waive competitive bidding requirements of the Columbus City Code sections 329 to authorize the director of public service to enter into a design agreement with Evans uh, Meckwork um, Hamilton and Tilton for the roadway improvements Cannon Drive relocation project to authorize the expenditure of $1 million from the streets and highways bonds fund and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I'd like to move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 1662-2014 to amend the 2014 capital improvements budget to authorize the city auditor to transfer cash and appropriations within the waterworks and in the enlargement voted bonds fund to waive the competitive bidding provisions of Columbus City Code for this project. To authorize a director of public service to enter a contract with GPD Associates for Engineering, Technical, and Surveying Services in connection with the roadway improvements, Livingston Avenue, front to fourth project. 
the authorized expenditure of up to $950,000 from the Streets and Highways Bonds Fund and up to $50,000 from the Waterworks Enlargement Voted Bonds Fund and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. And last in uh, public service and transportation is 1687-2014 to authorize the finance and management director to enter into a contract with Farmers Refuge and Trucking Incorporated for the option to purchase eight cubic yard front load refuse containers and to authorize expenditure of $1 to establish this contract from the general fund and to waive formal competitive bidding requirements and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. President Ginther, can I move on to the Technology Committee? 1475, 2014, to appropriate uh, $505,000 within the Special Income Tax Fund to authorize a director city auditor to transfer $300,000 appropriation between object levels within the Department of Technology Information Services Fund to authorize a director of finance and management to establish purchase orders on behalf of the Department of Technology and various city agencies for the purchase of replacement desktop computers, computer-related products and equipment from a pre-established universal term contract with Brown Enterprises Solution, LLC, and Smart Solution, LLC, to authorize expenditure of $608,663.30 from the Department of Technology Internal Services Fund and $505,000 from the Special in Income Tax Fund and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Bailey, Tyson, President Ginther. And that is all I have tonight for me, uh, President Ginther. Thank you, President Pro Tem Miller. Our next committee is the Development Committee. Council Member Mills chairs that committee. Madam Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Ginther. Tonight in development, have the following ordinances for consideration, beginning with Ordinance 1448-2014, to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into professional services contracts with various artists for the artist fees associated with their selected bike rack design proposals and to authorize the expenditure of $6,500 from the Northland and other acquisitions fund. Just to share a little bit of the history about the bike rack program, and I believe you'll see some of the images displayed, a request for proposals for artists was issued in July um, in August of 2013 and advertised a variety of art outlets and many other um, organizations. The artists were asked to submit up to two original design proposals and those selected uh, bike rack designs will be placed throughout the city. Of the 12 eligible proposals received, eight were advanced for voting in a web-based online selection survey. The participating recreation councils, area commissions, and center staff were notified of the project, the RFP process, as well as the web-based voting. I'm very proud to see the selections made. The sightseer being one of the selections which will be placed at all three rec centers, Barrick, Dodge, and Milo Grogan, as well as Whetstone. Uh, follow the bouncing ball, and you also see a, a picture of that will be placed at Blackburn, Tuttle, and Westgate. Sunflower Parking will be placed at Indian Mound, and Dreaming Big will be placed in front of the Dublin Road facility. Uh, the purpose of this legislation is to enter into a contract and provide a payment to the artists who created these wonderful designs that were selected. The artists will be paid $1,000 for the first time a proposal is selected, and then $500 per selection thereafter. The second phase of this project is fabrication and installation, which will be bid separately, and the project is expected to be completed in 2014. I want to thank the folks of the Columbus Art Commission uh, through the Department of Development, as well as the folks in Recreation and Parks Department, and also public utilities that initiated uh, the uh, pilot for the Public Art Bike Racks Program. And I want to thank them for their work on this, and especially thanking them for their inclusion of the community in this project. If there are no other comments or questions, I'd like to move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. 
Next, I have Ordinance 1488 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a Jobs Growth Incentive Agreement with Universal Fabricating and Construction Services, Inc., and One Source Employee Management, LLC, equal to 25% of the amount of new income tax withheld on employees for a term of five years in consideration of investing approximately $215,000 related to the acquisition of machinery and equipment retaining 40 full-time permanent positions and creating 30 new full-time permanent positions. Universal Fabricating and Construction Services investment of $250,000 will be a great addition. Uh, currently, uh, the retaining of 40 full-time permanent positions is an estimated annual payroll of approximately $2 million. And the creation of the new full-time permanent positions will be an estimated annual payroll of approximately $1.1 million. Uh, Universal Fabricating Construction Services was founded in 1987. If there are no other comments or questions, I'd like to move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next, uh, I have Ordinance 1492-2014 to authorize a director of the Department of Development to enter into a job creation tax credit agreement of 65% for a period of 10 years with ADS Alliance Data Systems, Inc. in consideration of the company's proposed total investment of $80.5 million and the creation of 700 new full-time permanent <coughs> positions. $80.5 million in the creation of 700 new full-time permanent positions um, through this proposed uh, investment for ADS. Um, in addition, um, the ADS is proposing these 700 new full-time permanent positions. I wanted to mention the annual payroll of approximately $52.5 million and a retaining of 1,300 full-time associates with an estimated annual payroll of $124.4 million. Just want to share with the community the uh, large investment of ADS and their expansion and continued commitment and, and thanking the folks at ADS for their diligence and the folks in the Department of Development for coming together in a partnership with the, the state. Really uh, glad to see this happen for our city and uh, the area of which ADS is located, the growth that's happening there, celebrating the ribbon cutting of Afrocentric's campus just down the road and just that whole corridor and its development. But again, um, ADS and their investment of $80.5 million is um, something that is to be encouraged and supported. And just want to share a little bit about um, ADS. Is, uh, they have three lines of business with more than $100 million in consumer relationships for some of the world's leading brands, and not just the nation, but the world's leading brands, including our own, The Limited. If there are no other comments or questions, I'd like to move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next, I have Ordinance 1630-2014 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a Columbus Downtown Office Incentive Agreement with Jenny Splendid Ice Creams, LLC, as provided in Columbus City Council Resolution 0088-X-2007, adopted June 4, 2007. I want to share a little bit, um, I hope everyone is familiar with Jenny's Splendid Ice Cream. If not, please become familiar. Um, this wonderful company uh, started its first prototype store in our own North Market in 1996 and then continued to open and, and gain additional stores throughout our city. Jenny's Splendid Ice Cream has received renowned recognition, bringing lots of attention to our great city through the Go to War for Outstanding Product Line, Go to War for Outstanding Dessert, and currently, uh, the 16 scoop shop locations are in five states, Georgia, Illinois, Ohio, South Carolina, and Tennessee. Jenny's Splendid Ice Creams is proposing to relocate its corporate headquarters from Clinton Township to Columbus by investing approximately $200,000 in leasehold improvements, which includes machinery, equipment, furniture, and fixtures. The company will enter into a long-term lease agreement on a vacant office space consisting of approximately 17,000 square feet, relocating 40 full-time jobs, which will now be in the city of Columbus, with an estimated annual payroll of approximately $2.43 million and the creation of 15 new full-time positions with annual payroll of approximately $1.5 million into the downtown business district. If there are no other comments or questions, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. 
Next, I have Ordinance 1631-2014 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a jobs growth incentive agreement with Com Resource Inc. equal to 25% of the amount of new income tax withheld on employees for a term of five years in consideration of the company's proposed investment of $50,000 and the creation of 50 new full-time permanent positions. The company's Integrative Services Division uh, delivers EDI, Business to Business, EAI, and SOA Consulting Services to, for to Fortune 500 companies in the United States and around the world. If there are no other comments or questions, I'd like to move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next, I have Ordinance 1632 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a Columbus downtown office incentive agreement with Cover My Meds LLC as provided in Columbus City Council Resolution 0088X-2007, adopted June 4, 2007. Uh, quick information related to Cover My Meds. Um, the, util the utilization of this company's software application permits providers to quickly process the necessary forms electronically reducing excess paperwork and accelerating patient access to vital medications. Cover My Meds provides a 100% free service to pharmacies and physicians bringing the paper-based workflow into a 21st century electronic process. Cover My Meds has created a PA model that improves efficiency and results in lower prescription abandonment. Uh, this proposal is to relocate and expand its current corporate headquarters by re investing approximately $1.52 million in leasehold improvements, which includes new construction of new signage, standalone computers, furniture, and fixtures. If there are no other comments or questions, I'd like to move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next, I have Ordinance 1664-2014 to authorize the Director of the Department of Development to enter into a contract with the Salvo Development Advisors, LLC, to undertake and prepare the Bryce Tussing Real Estate Market Study to authorize expenditure of $50,000 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. The Bryce Tussing area is in a transitional economic phase experiencing uh, vacancies, traffic concerns, and a lack of identity. A market study is being undertaken due to these conditions and certainly in anticipation of a 2015 update to the current Bryce Tussing area plan. The study will document the state of the current commercial market, vacancy rates, uh, and as well as commercial rents, and certainly forecast future absorption. It will certainly include additional recommendations addressing market constraints and as well as land use. Emergency action is requested to immediately begin the Bryce Tussing Real Estate Market Study. If there are no other comments or questions, I'd like to move for passage. Craig Line, Miller Mills, Paley Tyson, President Ginther. Next, I have 1711-2014 to amend the ordinance 0721-2014 approved by Columbus City Council on April 7, 2014. For the purpose of changing the job retention commitment in the job creation tax credit agreement with Midwest Motor Supply Company doing business as Kimball West from 307 full-time permanent employees with an associated annual gross payroll of approximately $18,161 $18, to 286 full-time permanent employees with an associated annual gross payroll of approximately oh, 18, eight, 888 <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> 18 million eight hundred eighty one thousand and to declare an emergency if there are no comments or questions I move for passage Craig Klein Miller Mills Paley Tyson President Ginther next I have ordinance 1713-2014 to amend ordinance 0720-2014 approved by Columbus City Council on April 7 2014 for the purpose of changing the job retention commitment in the Enterprise Zone Agreement with PEDC Property Management Inc. and Midwest Motor Supply Company doing business as Kimball West from 307 full-time permanent employees with an associated annual gross payroll of approximately 18,161,000 to 286 full-time permanent employees with an associated annual gross payroll of approximately 18881000 and to declare an emergency. If there are no comments or questions, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller Mills, Bailey Tyson, President Ginther. Council President Ginther, if you allow me, I'd like to yield the floor to Council Member Craig. 
Thank you, uh, Council Member Mills. Next, we'll go to the Education Committee. Uh, and Council Member Craig will be bringing legislation forward this evening. Council Member Craig. Uh, thank you, President Ginther. Uh, in education, uh, we have Ordinance 1697-2014 uh, uh, to authorize and direct the Director of Education to enter into contracts uh, with various quality uh, pre-kindergarten organizations to provide pre-kindergarten services in conjunction with similar awards between the State of Ohio and these organizations to waive competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code to authorize the expenditure of up to $700,000 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. Um, if there are no questions or comments, uh, I request a voice vote. Craig? Yes. Klein? Yes. Miller? Yes. Mills? Paley? Yes. Tyson? Yes. President Ginther? Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Council Member Craig. Anything else uh, from the Education Committee this evening? Our uh, final committee is the Administration Committee. Council Member Paley chairs that committee. Madam Chair, the floor is yours. We have one piece of legislation, 1609 2014, to accept Memorandum of Understanding 2014 02, executed between representatives of the City of Columbus and Columbus Municipal Association of Government Employees, Local 4502, which amends the collective bargaining agreement April 24, 2011 through April 23, 2014, and to declare an emergency. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President, Ginther. And that's all I have this evening. Thank you, uh, Council Member Paley. There's nothing else to come before Council. We do have one non-agenda speaker we'll take momentarily. Nothing else to come before Council. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Clerk, call the roll. Craig Klein, Miller, Mills, Paley, Tyson, President Ginther. We stand adjourned. We'll take our non-agenda speaker momentarily. <laughs>